Noting the hour and the presence of a quorum, I call the Acton Boxborough Regional School Committee to order. We are in person tonight, and uh, members who do wish to view the meeting may do so <coughs> excuse me, using Acton TV's YouTube channel, which is found at the top of the agenda. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted to the Acton TV's website at actontv.org. Welcome, everybody. Especially welcome to Rebecca Wilson, who's our new member from Acton. Thank, congratulations and thank you to Ginny Krimmer, who was also revoted to on her re-election. Our new member from Boxborough will be joining us at our next meeting. I also want to thank our town meeting members from both towns for passing our budget, and a special thanks for, uh, to John Peterson for representing the committee in Acton. All right, as usual, we have a packed agenda, so we're gonna move right into public participation. So, per policy B, E, D, H, members of the public are invited to speak for up to three minutes during public participation time regarding, item, regarding items that are not on the agenda. For items that are on the agenda, the public is asked to wait for that item. The committee does not typically respond to comments during public participation. I would ask that speakers be respectful and civil. Anybody here for public participation? Seeing none, Peter, superintendent's update. All right, so um, first, welcome everyone. Um, I just wanna recognize, I see we have a number of school age people here, um, but I only see, I think, a few whose last week will be next week. Um, so I just wanna congratulate our seniors because they are coming to the end of their time here at AB. Uh, this is 13 years of education they've been working toward and they are headed toward commencement and graduation. So congratulations to all of our seniors um, over the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, for school committee, uh, just as a reminder, graduation is June 3rd, uh, Friday night. Um, so, you know, if you are available, we always love to have our school committee members be able to be there and participate in that as well and kind of just get an opportunity to see the kids walk across the stage because it really is probably, you know, one of the most impactful moments um, in terms of what we do in schools. On the note around graduation, we do need some volunteers, and I'm sending out a call for help um, on behalf of Project Graduation. We sent that out earlier today. I'm gonna send it out again in the note to families tomorrow as part of the full package, but Project Graduation desperately needs um, volunteers to man that night. Um, if you don't know what Project Graduation is, it's an incredibly important event in our community. It's an all-night, substance-free, and all-inclusive event that offers our graduates uh, one final event to celebrate their time as Acton Boxborough students. The event truly does rely on the participation of many and we're asking uh, people to consider offering a bit of their time to that event as a way to continue the pay it forward model that has served our community so well. When you know our family's children attend project graduation in the future, our hope is that family mem members of younger students step up. So we know we can't rely on the families of seniors to staff project graduation. It's really critical to have uh, the families of our younger students kind of in that pay it forward model be able to step up and provide some help and supervision and guidance and assistance during that night. So we would encourage people to volunteer some time. It is also on Friday night, June 3rd, and it starts at 9.30 p.m. Um, COVID cases, I wanna give a little bit of update on those. We're continuing to see a push in cases and have seen quite a few cases of COVID in our schools over the last month. We do continue to meet with our health advisory team bi-weekly to review our cases. Um, we have fielded a number of questions over the last week or so, asking if we intend to implement a mask requirement uh, during the surge. At this point, we have determined as an administration to align our COVID mitigation strategies with those of the Acton Board of Health um, and any other guidance that we might receive from the state. Uh, this is in recognition that although our cases are higher than we would like, we have a highly vaccinated population, uh, which is helping to keep the severity of illness low. Uh, should either of the entities that I mentioned previously uh, begin to require indoor masking, at that time we would similarly have to follow suit, uh, but we do not intend to independently pursue any requirements as a school district. We will continue to report cases to families through our COVID-19 tracker so that families can make individual decisions about appropriate precautions for their family. 
Um, I would encourage families to take precautions that balance risks on a personal level that include both health and safety considerations, but also possible opportunities lost due to absences related to COVID-19. We know five days out at this time of year um, can be challenging. And so I think at this point of the pandemic, thinking about opportunities lost may be equally important to thinking about you know, health and safety protocols. So I think you know, we want families to be able to independently balance those two things and consider them. Family surveys about climate and culture. Next week, we're gonna be sending families a survey that's focused on various aspects of the student and family experience at Acton Boxborough this year. Earlier this month, I distributed a different family survey that focused on questions inviting families to briefly identify school-related topics most important to them, so the school committee and I could potentially identify various patterns and themes within the community. This survey that we're gonna be sending out includes categories and questions that are targeted to uh, families and their child's school experiences this year. It's asking for their views about school climate, engagement, learning environments, and roles and responsibilities. Our goal is to have information that we can review as a leadership team to identify important themes and patterns to guide our ongoing work uh, both at the school and district level. The survey will likely require about 15 minutes of people's time and the questions are all multiple choice. While the results can be organized by school and some questions around services uh, your child might receive, the responses are completely anonymous. The survey will be available in 17 languages and the options can be found at the top of that survey page. Um, we just wanna thank people in advance for taking the time to complete that survey. I wanna recognize our staff who just are completing their 20th year of service at Acton Boxborough. So last Thursday, May 12th, we recognized 30 staff who are celebrating their 20th year working in our schools. The recognition event took place um, at a ceremony sponsored by the Acton Boxborough Education Association. This is a fun event that includes each staff member's colleagues speaking briefly about their contributions to our schools. This is an event that is uniquely AB and is a great reminder that our district is a special place. I wanna congratulate all of the staff who were recognized this year. They include Jenna Bardsley, Martha Bethel, Amanda Bromberg, David Bouchard, Kathleen Bauer, Peter Cacho Cat Cacciola, excuse me, uh, Margaret Callahan, uh, Maura Cedrone, Sarah Clinton, Catherine Cattini, Aaron Doherty, Aaron Foley, Alexandra Gantz, Genevieve Hammond, Nicole Janot, Christiane Kelly, Paula Sage, Kathy Lobes, Kim Luongo, Amy Maciel, Colleen McGovern, Melissa Meek, Allison Morell, Kristen Olson, Jean Oviat Rothman, Karen, Pro I'm gonna say this name wrong and I am so sorry, Karen. Karen Procuio, Susan Spencer, Rari Sweeney, Erin Sweeney, and Deb Trench. Uh, so thank you to all of those individuals for all of they've given to our students and families over the last 20 years. We look forward to many more. Um, it is almost moving day for the Boardwalk Campus. Uh, this week marked an important milestone in our building project as moving boxes are beginning to get delivered to the schools and classrooms. Um, I'm sure there were some mixed emotions for our staff uh, and those probably included excitement for the new school, coupled with some sadness of saying goodbye to their current buildings and then certainly a realization um, that getting classrooms and offices packed and then unpacked requires a tremendous effort on the part of our staff. The good news is that our building project continues to be on time and under budget and the school is taking shape quickly. Over the last few weeks and months, we've conducted staff tours of the school so they can better understand the spaces they will move into. If anyone would like to learn more about the building project, we certainly encourage uh, people to visit our you know, bi-weekly update page where people can see kind of the history of the construction taking place and activity on that project. I also just wanna end by thanking all of our staff and administration at Douglas Gates and our preschool for all of the planning and work that goes into making that move successful for students. Finally, I wanna thank uh, the members of the Acton and Boxborough Town Meetings. Um, on behalf of the students, staff, and families, thank you so much to those who attended the recent town meetings in Acton and Boxborough for their continued support in passing our budget. I also wanna recognize that while the budget was passed, we, also, we did hear concerns from both communities about the sustainability of budget increases and the impact of increasing taxes on families, especially when coupled with rising inflation. This is certainly something we need to uh, consider as we move through the next several years budget processes and cycles, but I wanna thank both communities for the continued support of our schools. So thank you very much, Adam, and I will turn it back. Thank you, Peter. Any questions for Peter? Um, can, can I just say one thing about um, project graduation? The first time I 
uh, volunteered to work on that. I think my girls were in um, elementary school and, and uh, junior high, and it is just mind blowing uh, what how the high school gets transformed. It's such an amazing event. There was a casino, there was a restaurant. I mean, it was it was amazing. Um, so parents of seniors are not allowed to be there because no no kids want their parents <laughs> at, at that all night party. Um, and it, it's shifts, so you wouldn't have to stay the whole night. I think um, if anybody has any time, even a couple hours to help to set that up and then to, to break it down the next day is an amazing um, amount of work. And, um, and then just to hang out that night um, is, is something that, that they need. So if anybody can, can help out, it would really, really be appreciated. Thanks. Thanks, Jimmy. Any other questions or comments? I'll send my appreciation to those staff as well who completed their 20 years at the district. Personally, I haven't lasted more than six years at any company, so I don't know how 20 years <laughs> happens. All right, uh, moving on now to our first presentation of the evening, uh, which is the acceptance of the official ABRSD mascot. And uh, with that, Peter, I'll turn it back to you. All right, so thank you, Adam. So, you know, I just want to, you know, take an opportunity. There is a memo in your packet. Um, as you remember from the last meeting, uh, we, you know, provided an update uh, with regard to the school mascot. And tonight we're going to talk a little bit more about that. You are going to hear an opportunity to hear from some of our students and staff on a video um, that they created to be able to present to you. Um, and then hear from a couple of members of our um, subcommittee. Um, specifically to the mascot. So, you know, without further ado, um, I do want to introduce uh, Chris Lynette as well as Meg Spring, um, who have, you know, dutifully served on the mascot subcommittee. Um, they're here to speak with you tonight, but I think they want to kick it off by showing you a brief video of some students. One of the reasons I want to be on the mascot working group is because I've gone to all the active boxer schools, elementary school, junior high, all the way up to the high school. And you know, being here for so long, I really want to leave a lasting impact on the community and the school district here, and you know, really be a part of something bigger after all the school has done for me. Um, I think the process definitely took a lot of work, and you know, there are definitely times where you know we were kind of at a standstill, but I think those times were you know some of our most productive we really worked through things and um you know it we we looked at all the options everything really narrowed it down and i think you know ev you know everyone was part of it and i think that's really important and i've lived in acton for nearly a decade um, one of the reasons that i wanted to be on this committee was because my own high school and college each recently changed their mascots as well and i wanted to make sure uh, that we chose something unconventional uh, I brought a minor league baseball team name aesthetic to the proceedings. Uh, revolution was not my top choice. Uh, but I think the fact that my personal preference didn't win speaks to how very student-centric the process was. Um, one thing, one valuable lesson that I've learned as an educator is that as adults, we have to be willing to lose on some things to our students. Uh, we don't compromise on the quality of their education or the health and safety of our community, but can we let kids move on from a problematic mascot and choose one uh, that's new and feels more representative of who we are and who we wanna be? I think so. My high school and college alma maters are no worse for the wear for being, bears and mammoths now, and I think we'll be okay too. Go AB. I just wanted to say it was a joy to watch these young students work towards a new mascot. I watched them take a charge from the school committee, discuss their values they wanted represented in the new mascot, collect the data, and use that data to name the new mascot. They were incredibly thoughtful throughout the process. They spent many hours meeting and discussing the pros and cons. They listened to feedback that the subcommittee provided. They questioned themselves. They had difficult conversations and made an incredible decision. Watching this process take place this year has been an honor, and I will be proud to call the school the revolution. Um, 
The process of selection was completed through a series of meetings throughout the year where we all got together and were able to discuss our opinions and come up with ideas on how we should continue on selecting a new mascot. And it was really nice to get together and just hear different opinions and express your own opinions. Um, the interaction with the AB community was very helpful throughout this process because we were able to, you know, look at people's ideas and understand their opinions and take it into consideration when selecting a new mascot. And I think it's really important for the community to have a say on what our new mascot was going to be, which was very helpful. Bye. I have to admit I was a little bit sad and nostalgic when I found out that the Colonial's mascot was going to be retired. I have a lot of great memories from being a Colonial, and I thought when we moved back to Acton, my daughter would be one too. But I recognize Colonial's doesn't have a positive connotation for everyone, and I wanted to be on the mascot committee so I could honor the past and look forward to the future. This experience has been a little bit of a microcosm of democracy. There were a lot of ideas, a lot of big feelings, and a lot of hard work, especially on the uh, part of the students. But we came together and out of many came one, and that is the revolution. And I couldn't be prouder of everybody's hard work, and I can't wait for my daughter to be part of the AB revolution. Go Revs. As somebody who had tremendous pride in their high school and college sports teams, um, I was a college coach in track and field, um, I know how important it is to kind of feel that camaraderie and that atmosphere that you get that comes from having um, spirit around your mascot. So um, I was really excited for the opportunity to actually be involved in a very unique process of being able to select a school's mascot um, to be now, from now till, till, till uh, who knows how long, um, maybe hundreds of years. So um, that was my motivation. Um, uh, knowing how much I loved being part of sports teams and being involved in athletics and the camaraderie and atmosphere that was created um, when I was a college athlete and high school athlete. Um, what a great opportunity it was uh, to, have, to be able to do this with AB and the students here and to guide them um, in their exploration of something that brings them great pride. To be honest, in the fall and being new, I didn't really know what to expect. 15 students and eight staff members got together every week from November through April to try to determine what our new mascot would be. We came to the table, we discussed complex ideas, different perspectives, and what a mascot would mean to this community. I can only describe the entire process as inspirational. In particular, the students were able to coalesce together around one mascot, the revolution. Positive change, honoring our past, present, and future, difference makers, innovators, barrier breakers. I couldn't be more proud of the students. Congratulations. Go AB Revs. I decided to join this committee because on a daily basis I hear a lot of different opinions about our mascot and how it should be changed. I also have a lot of opinions myself. I have a lot of opinions on the process. Um, I believe that our community should have a big say in how our, in how our mascot should be changed because our community cares. It's a community, it's a community icon. And I was very proud of our, commu our committee that we decided to make sure that the community had a voice. Um, I thought we made a good effort to make it a fair voice, a fair amount of, of input to our, to our decision. So um, thank you guys, thank you, thank you community, and I'm proud of our committee and the process that we made. <laughs> I wanted to be on the mascot committee because I wanted to be a voice for international students, immigrated students, and non-native English speakers at AB. I think it's not about the original intention of the old mascot, it's about the impact it had towards members of our community. And this is so important to me because I care about working to make everyone feel welcome and included. Community input was so crucial to making this change. However, at the end of the day, it was about picking a mascot that represents Acton Foxborough's progressive students. To me, being the revolution means we are united, strong change makers and leaders. Thank you to everyone who helped make this change. Hi, um, 
I'm Chris Lynette. Um, I was on the subcommittee. Um, I have two children in the Acton Boxborough High School. And the experience of being on this committee, working with the students strictly in an advisory capacity, was unbelievably heartwarming. To see them come to each meeting every other week, sometimes they look defeated, and we would talk them through the process and they heard everything that we had to say. And it wasn't so much on making a decision, it was really guiding them through the process to make that decision. And to see them do that, and to see them use the data that they gathered, the voices from the community, to make this decision was really an incredibly proud moment, especially when they came to us and they said, this is what we decided, we heard what you had to say, and this is who we are. And the fact that they came and they said we are AB Revolution was a very good moment. It was a very proud moment. And you could see it in their eyes when they were speaking to us about it. And it was a very heartfelt moment and one that I know I'm going to cherish. And I was looking at some of my notes and the first meeting was December. So, and we've been meeting basically every other week since then, helping these students. And towards the end there, I, you could see it on their faces that they, were, they had long days, long days of not just being in, this, in their committee, they're incredibly involved students. So they had that stuff on top of school, on top of work, and they were still so dedicated to the process and what they found, it was a truly remarkable experience. Good evening, my name is Meg Spring. I'm the low talker on the video. <laughs> I'm a 1994 graduate of Acton Boxborough High School. Um, I loved my um, high school days and I loved being part of that community. I was vice president of the student council, the National Honor Society, and co-captain of the varsity football and hockey cheerleaders. And I also did the musicals, so I was involved in everything during the high school period. And I have to admit that when I first heard that um, the Colonial's mascot was going to be changed, I felt sort of nostalgic and sad. But I recognize that the term um, colonial has a different connotation than it had in 1994. And so I decided to join the committee because I wanted to be part of the process to see uh, if we could bring the community together. And I didn't know what to expect and I cannot even articulate how amazing the students were and how proud of their work I am. Um, I, I'm a mom of an eighth grader. My daughter Lizzie's in eighth grade at um, RJ Gray, so I don't want to get all mom on you, but these students, um, the hard work, the passion they put into it, the fact that they took it so seriously, and the fact that they really wanted to bring the entire community along. So with respect to the data that um, brought them to the revolution, there were surveys, they took the data, they crunched the data, they spoke about it, they brought it back to us, we had conversations about concerns we might have. We had questions about how they were doing it. They answered all of those questions um, and they brought it back. So I don't know if you could hear on the video, but I said the whole process was sort of a microcosm of democracy itself because there were a lot of ideas, there was a lot of passion, um, there were a lot of people who had a lot of different opinions. And over the course of time, due to the students' hard work and the scientific mechanism by which they brought along with them, out of many came one, and revolution was what we came up with and I think it could not um, better articulate where our community has been and where we're going so it honors our history um, and it's inclusive and I am excited for my daughter to be a revolution and I really appreciate your time um, for listening to us and um, talking to us about our process so thank you so you know again you know I want to recognize you know both of you thank you so much Chris thank you so much Meg um, I know, you know, for all the other committee members, and they're in the memo, um, there was a lot of time put in by various committee members. Um, I also just want to recognize, you know, we have a few of the students here tonight, um, so thank you so much uh, for coming. Um, but I, you know, want to thank all of the students and staff who were involved in this process. Um, I think, you know, from everyone who I've talked to, um, from an adult perspective, who was part of that student meeting, they were just, in, you know, really in awe of the work that our high school students did uh, to lift this process and carry it through. So incredible thank you. I know it was also tough because I know, you know, just like we understand, I know you also recognized that there was a significant part of this community that did not want to give up the colonial. Um, and I know you saw it in your survey data. Um, 
you saw it come in, you saw it come in consistently. Um, we've seen the same thing. I think we all we all know that, and I think you know it's important to recognize and that you know from our student perspective, you know, really coming out of the the discussions we had as a school committee, you know, or you had as a school committee and me as a superintendent, really it was about you know moving forward and selecting the next mascot um, and so you know I think students you know you did a good job recognizing kind of where the community was and I think that was a factor that played into how you ultimately chose to move forward and trying to choose something that could honor both the past and the present and future um, as Meg said um, you know I think you know I just want to say you know it, this is a tough road for a lot of members of our community um, and it's been a long road for them you know that is hard you know and I want to recognize that and in moving forward I think the number one thing you know from an administrative standpoint we've all said and I know I've talked to you know the principal athletic director um, other administrators in the district and I think the subcommittee felt the same way and a lot of our students this was not about getting rid of the period of time where AB was the Colonials. Uh, we can still celebrate that period of time and we can recognize it and all the great things that happened in our community during that time. But I think you know the recommendation moving forward is now about looking to the future and how are our students gonna be represented and what will happen next in our schools. Um, and I think you know just recognizing that tension I think is an important part of this process and it needs to be said um, because you know, I, I think, you know, what we've heard from our community is there was a feeling that parts of the community didn't have the voice that they wanted to have. We have to recognize that um, and be able to name it in order to, you know, at least from my standpoint, making that final recommendation forward from our subcommittee, it was something that we talked about. Um, and we just don't want to lose sight of that, even as we, you know, make the recommendation to move forward. So, you know, with that, I'll turn it over to you, um, but we are formally recommending um, that we become the Acton Boxborough Revolution or AB Revolution. And again, the uh, description that our students wanted to you know, make sure was front and center was the fight for positive change and equity never ends. It's the voice of the people, a revolution. It acknowledges our past but speaks to our future. We are innovators, barrier breakers, and difference makers. A revolution represents a show of ingenious strength, challenging, outsmarting, and overwhelming the status quo. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Meg and Chris. Uh, all right, at this point, I am going to uh, take things a little out of order. I'd like to uh, give the public one more time uh, to have their chance to comment on this and then go around the table and have the committee uh, discuss and see if they want to take the vote. So uh, I would like to ask that the public does re refrain from any audible recognition of support or otherwise during the public comment period. Our goal is to give everyone an opportunity to make a statement, and as such, public comment for this agenda item is going to be limited to 90 seconds. With that, I'll invite members of the public to come up. Hi, I'm Corinne Hogseth in Indian Village. Now, we know this was never a student-led initiative. Alumni started the Absedge group and wrote the petition to get rid of the Colonial, then worked with the progressive staff members to force the issue into classrooms. We've heard from at least a couple Absedge, uh, that at least a couple members of Absedge were cajoled by Peter into presenting the petition, being told to just do the presentation and the school committee will take care of the rest. We've heard and read accounts of bullying not only among students, but by teachers against students who supported keeping the Colonial. The district's naming policy FF states, the community believes it should not be influenced in its decision by personal prejudice, favoritism, per political pressure, or temporary popularity. Your entire handling of this episode shows that it was all about your personal prejudices. Two of you have already been caught violating the district's technology policy and in doing so violated open meeting law. Your texts prove that you are heavily biased towards one outcome. Your open and enthusiastic support for Representative Gouveia, who has pushed legislation regarding offensive mascots, suggests you brought your own politics to the table as well. One of you violated conflict of interest law by not disclosing your relationship with one of the absent petitioners. And a few of you are still subject to ongoing Records request. By my account, this administration and this committee have lied to the community, manipulated kids, violated two state laws, and three district policies. This is more corrupt than the events that led to the railroading the pre of the previous superintendent out of town. Ten seconds. You don't care because the end of ends justify the means. Um, three of the four people that actually hoped to keep the, that vote going in October are gone, unfortunately, but I hope the one that remains has the courage to admit he was wrong and vote to not Thank change you. the name of the mascot.
Christine Case Bolt, Boxborough. At Boxborough's annual town meeting last week, our select board presented a slide entitled Fiduciary Responsibility Duty. The first bulleted item said, people with fiduciary duty must act in a way that will benefit someone else. The second bulleted item read, members of boards and committees appointed and elected have an ethical and legal obligation to put the town's interests ahead of their own personal interests. Speaking for myself and others with whom I've discussed this, we have difficulty understanding how it's at all possible to reconcile retirement of the colonial in favor of the revolution while upholding your fiduciary duty to our towns. Thank you. Christine Marlowe, Boxborough. We believe that the process was illegitimate and caused great division anger and hatred throughout this, our towns and at a level that has never been seen before. You can't take away or erase the true heroes of this town, the ones who fought and died on April 19, 1775, which is what the colonials were named after. You said that the cost is going to be net zero. However, we know that you have spent at least around 20 grand in legal fees preventing us from getting the um, uh, texts and emails that you sent to each other and we're missing three months of legal fee bills and we still haven't received everything that the Secretary of State said you should be sending to us. What are you trying to hide? And, and I really, I have to say, the process was so flawed. If you really wanted to know what our community want, you should have given us all an opportunity. You started this in 2020, the fall of 2020, when half, we weren't even in school full time, and people were struggling with death, illness, and f their f financial situation. Um, so I say to you, please stop saying that the Colonials are worth something to you because you really showed that they are not. Thank you. Alyssa Nicole Acton. I want to thank once again all those who made it possible for this district to retire a problematic mascot and adopt a new one that more inclusively represents our past, present, and future. I also want to offer a reminder of why we went through this process. I read from emails sent to the school committee in the fall of 2020 from one of our faculty. Not a small percentage of students express they do not want a mascot that simplifies and possibly glorifies a complicated portion of our history. While I do not think student voices should always be a determining factor, the mascot is for them, meant to be a symbol around which the students can form community and bond. From three siblings, alums of 2015, 2020, and a current student. My grandfather fled his birthplace of Ludhiana for newly created Pakistan when one of these arbitrary borders bisected the Muslim community and violence and mass immigration, migration ensued. A mascot that does not trivialize the violence against our Asian American, Black American, and Indigenous American classmates and community members is the bare minimum in creating a more inclusive act in Boxborough. From a student, now a senior. I am a proud Native American. The colonial, regardless of intent, embodies the era in which my people were systematically killed, tortured, and erased from the history of our nation. Insensitive. It is offensive and incredibly insensitive to place this symbol of white oppression on a pedestal for students. Thank you all. Thank you. Hi, Jennifer Campbell, Boxborough. Um, one thing I find really strange about this is that the um, argument to uh, honor our history by using the word colonial when the people who fought in the revolution were literally fighting against being colonized. So I feel like revolution is a much better name for honoring those people. But most importantly, we have a very diverse population and some of whom have come from or have family who've come from nations that are dealing with their very complex and difficult um, history of colonization. And we need to put their needs before any issues that we have about our past and, and what that means to us. Um, this change will really respect our current population and their concerns, and I'm grateful that we found a, a way that we can move forward, but also recognize our history. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, Nijan Data, Runcliffe Drive. We just finished a town meeting in Acton where an unheard of 40% thought that the school budget is unbalanced and needed to be amended. Though the amendment failed, I hope you recognize that the fiscal situation is not stable. If the experience of other towns is to be believed, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars to make this change. This is not petty cash level of spending, and the budget should have had its own line item, but you did not want sunlight directed at the true cost of this change. Throughout the country, schools have diverted their attention from educational basics and gone into unnecessary political and ideological waters. As a result, public school enrollment has plummeted nationwide with parents opting for various forms of alternative schooling. We here have lost 472 students since regionalization and perhaps will lose more when this year's numbers come in. But let's put all that aside and just look at the fiscal situation and recognize that this expenditure should be put on hold until you have a true grasp of the total cost of this name change. We cannot afford an expensive override next year. And given that Monday's amendment did not attract two thirds to oppose it, the town may not even vote for an override. Then the cuts will have to be much larger. I hope calmer heads can prevail and a pause instituted for mainly fiscal reasons, as we really cannot afford it, as proven by the need that you're dipping into free cash for 1.5 million. Please delay this name change Ten until seconds. the fiscal situation is under control. Minimizing layoffs and maintaining educational priorities is more important than changing the name of the mascot right now. Thank you. <laughs> Stella Coke, Uswood Road, Acton. I just want to say thank you again to the school committee and to all the students who worked on the mascot issue and really appreciate that they were good listeners and I hope that we as the adults learn from our students. Thanks. Thank you. Jim Carey, Gustwood Road. Um, in preparing for the town meeting this week, I actually looked up the uh, AB High School diversity, and I was astonished that the population that I went to school with is now only 51% of the total population of the school. I think that's actually a testament to the work that's going on here and in other places to improve our inclusion, and this is just another step in that direction. I applaud that activity. I want to see more of it. I think it's a reason to live here in Acton, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, good evening, Martin Benson, 21 Deacon Hunt Drive. Um, first, revolutions often incur extraordinary loss of life, property, opportunity, and culture. This name promotes the false implication that all revolutions bring about positive social change. However, revolutions in other areas of the world haven't all led to the progressive outcomes which were experienced here in Massachusetts. Perhaps more time is needed to explore this concern. Secondly, there are ethical issues which need to be addressed before a vote occurs this evening. Ms. Wilson-Cook, Ms. Krista Murphy, and Ms. McKinley have all admitted in a written OML response to exchanging text messages with each one another during the October 15th, 2020 meeting to retire the colonial mascot. These text messages are public records. These individuals have disregarded multiple orders from the Secretary of State's office to release these records in accordance with the public records law. As this legal matter is still ongoing, they should recuse themselves from the vote this evening. Third, another member has a family relationship with an individual who is active in the colonial mascot retirement movement. It would be ethical for her to recuse herself to avoid a conflict of interest. Lastly, Superintendent Light, your behavior throughout the entire colonial mascot retirement has been shameful. Process matters and by disregarding it, you have divided a town for a generation while erasing its cherished history, which was evident this which was evident in Acton's cancellation of Patriots Day this past year. You have blatantly yes, disregarded the public records law and have been untruthful to the Secretary of State's office on three separate occasions. Your own emails acknowledge that you publicly blamed the colonial mascot supporters for the Zoom bombing as revenge for the records requested submit, which were submitted. You. When you were asked publicly at a meeting when the records would be produced, you Thank smirked. You. Good evening, Madeline Cruz Acton. As a woman of color who is equally represented, not only by Africa, but also by Europe and the Caribbean, I am proud to say that I support the revolution. I say that it's time for change. And I am so proud of our town because on Tuesday night, Acton voted to support the 
flag in the seal of Massachusetts to be changed. And for all of you who are against the mascot being changed, you should be ashamed of yourself and you should educate yourselves a little bit more. The only thing the colonials did was fight off the British. Otherwise than that, they committed massive murders, they raped and they stole land and that as a person who's equally representative by all these um, races and ethnicities, I can say that if I can acknowledge what one side of me um, was affected by, I can also acknowledge that the colonials did a lot of damage and it's time to put it to rest. We need to equally be represented um, by a mascot and as having a mother who has three children and one is privileged and two are not, um, I am proud to continue raising my children in a community that can stand up to bigotry and that can stand up to Thanks. the racism. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you to all the members of the public who came to comment on that. At this point, we'll turn back to the committee and I'm happy to hear comments from the committee. Evelyn. Thank you, Adam. I wanted to start by thanking the mascot committee and all the students that participated in this process for all the time you've invested in it. And if, in case people were wondering who that family member was, who had a family member on that mascot or on upset, is me. I am Evelyn Abaya Issa. My daughter, Kubura Issa, is with upset. When I sit here, I represent myself and the town of Boxborough. I do not represent my family here, and I do my job as I prescribed. But I have to say that I have two girls who played hockey, and they wore the, uh, the, the colonial up until a few weeks ago. I actually have the colonial sign on my mantle. My daughter, son was number 14 on the team. Her, um, sign in her locker room is on my mantle. This is not to cancel the colonials and pretend that it did not exist. This is to move us towards a place of inclusivity and equity and equality for all. And I hope that the issues that this school committee, this school district is experiencing, like equity for kids of color, we, we, the, the, the energy with which we're putting in this matter, if we put it on all school committee matters and school issues, we will move this school district forward. We sat here and listened to a mascot presentation, and when data was being presented, a black and brown kids are failing in this school district. Everybody got up and walked away. Black and brown kids are failing. They're not doing well in this district. People got up and walked away. You cannot care about one thing and leave another thing. Black and brown people are human beings in this district. We belong here. We belong here. And this is not about any white supremacy, white privilege. If you don't see what you want, yeah, you can stand up at the mic and accuse people and lie. But when things are not going right, you cannot come up to the mic and say, superintendent lie. Tell me why black and brown kids are failing in this district. Why are they constantly behind? Nobody has asked that question. I've been on this school committee two years. Nobody has looked at that packet and said, why don't we have black teachers? Why don't we have black counselors in this district? Why are the black babies in this school district so disproportionately at disadvantage? Why are they suffering? Why? Why? I had a mom call me yesterday crying about her kid and how the kid is being treated in high school and how the kid is not being supported. Nobody has come to this mic to ask about that. Statistics show that black kids have a higher incidence of suicide than any kids, kids of any races in this country. You're failing the black and brown kids in this district and the passion with which you put on this mascot, I hope that you will put it in the people in the community that you see in the grocery stores, that you walk your kids play with, that your kids drive with, that you say hi to. Thank you. Ben. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to take a moment to thank my fellow members of the Mascot Renaming Subcommittee for their work during the last few months. In particular, I want to recognize our three student members, Tara, Ryan, and Will, for their steady leadership throughout the process. Thank you, guys. As student leaders, these three young adults navigated seamlessly both the subcommittee and, the, and working with the AB school body, <clears throat> excuse me, student body, for whom they represent as a whole. Their thoughtful hard work and consistent attention to detail while working with the student working group should be lauded. Furthermore, I'd like to reiterate, this process was driven and led by these dynamic young leaders who conducted themselves pro with professionalism, grace, and dignity especially when emotions, drive, uh, when emotions were driving charged responses from a group of individuals from within our community. We as adults can learn a lot from these brave students. In closing, I'm grateful for the work that this subcommittee has engaged in. Let's support the naming of uh, the Acton Boxborough mascot as the Acton Boxborough Revolution. Let's go Ravs. Thank you, Ben. Yevin. Thank you. So first of all, I will, uh, I will express my gratitude to all the, uh, the work has been done by the, our uh, student group and the screening committee and also the summer committee. I mean, I, I have a full face in the due process, I mean, to, to come up with a new uh, mascot. So by looking at the language we developed the fight for the positive changes and equity and so on that's I say this is a wonderful language and but but I was uh, when it's it's hard for me to make a connection between this word and the revolution so I would say these words are positive side of the revolution but this revolution has a negative side there's a dead dark side Okay, I t totally just, I'd like to share my perspe personal perspective. So, uh, so, forgive me, I'm not a native speaker, so I have to check dictionary to understand what revolution means to the native speaker, okay. So let me bring up the definition. I checked the Google, uh, Wikipedia and also the dictionary. Uh, I just make some examples. So, what is a revolution? By dictionary.com. First, so it has six meanings. One, an overthrow or repudiation and the thorough replacement of an established government or political systems by the people governed. Number two, radical and pervasive change in society and the social structure. Especially one made suddenly and often accompanied by violence. Third, a sudden, complete and a marked change in something. Force is uh, related to the mechanics revolution, okay, rotation, so I, I guess that's uh, nothing, it's a neutral. So I just wanted to, I was just looking into this uh, so Wikipedia has expressed a similar, uh, I would say, there's a social, I mean, there's a bunch of things. I mean, so let me give you some example, right? So when, when I read the revolution, what's come to my top of my head is the uh, American Revolution War, great. That's actually, I totally, uh, with you guys, actually it's, uh, it's our past and also it's, uh, uh, it's connecting the future also. So that's uh, great. But on the other hand, the, I mean, like French, French Revolution, great. Russia Revolution, 1970, 1917, right? So, question mark. Chinese Revolution in 1940s, probably not. Chinese Cultural Revolution of the 1960s and the 70s, but it eradicated totally Chinese traditional culture and make millions of people die. So that's also on top of my head is the industrial revolution. First generation, second generation, third generation, we are in the fourth generation. Those are great. So technically also the movie Matrix Revolution, great movie. Right? So, <laughs> so I mean, 
So those are come to my top, top of my head. I mean, so it could be bad thing. Also, it's not so always, uh, we can't just paint the revolution uh, so rosy and uh, always thinking about the positive side, but there could be uh, bad consequences. You know, in, in 1950 or 60, 70, 80, whatever, if it's anti-revolution, you, you got a death penalty in China. So, so totally, it's my just personal perspective, okay? I just wonder, with that, all those being said, uh, last one, there's no doubt uh, in the deep of my heart, our students have the freedom to pick what they want. Uh, but it's is it necessary to choose such a provocative turn? I'm not so sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Yevon. Anybody? Andrew. Andrew, then Amy. Thanks, Adam, and thank you again, folks. You know, uh, earlier tonight, someone mentioned April 19th, 1775, and that, that was the day that the, the shot heard around the world was made, and on that day, brave folks from Acton stood up. On that day, with that shot, the revolution was begun. On that day, with that shot, those colonials threw off their rulers. On that day, with that shot, those colonials became Americans. This, this came from students. They made a change. They brought this to life. They stood up for their beliefs. They looked to us at our community, and now, better than anyone, understand who we are, how we are, what we were, and how we can become more. They came together for hours, for days, dozens of pizzas, and focused our community's core personality attributes, ideas, and aspirations into a single, solid concept. Change is hard. It means recognizing not just where you're from, but where you want to go. It means moving forward. It means standing for growth, even when some don't want to grow. It proves your character. And as you bring something new to the world, as you take every day thereafter to make that which was new into that which is normal, you know, that's hard. This is not just a name. It's what we do. We spark change. We create a new way to look at our community. We created a revolution. I want to thank the students, the subcommittee, superintendent, and everyone in the community who will be able to show how strong we have been, how strong we will be. This is a revolution, act in Boxborough revolution. I think you guys have done a fantastic job coming together around this, and I want to thank you for it. Back to you. Thanks. Um, I, I wanted to kind of address what you said, Yebin. I, you know, this was not my choice. I, I, when I saw the options, I, I didn't vote for revolution. I sat in, I didn't sit in, I zoomed in on the last meeting of the mascot, well, I, the one when they kind of announced the, the name, the revolution. I was so blown away by these kids and what they, the energy and the positivity and the, just the, the way that they, they really put themselves out there to make a choice like this. And I know a couple of you from when you were teeny tiny little kids. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm so impressed. I'm, I'm so pressed. I'm so proud. I'm so proud to be part of this community. I understand change is hard. I understand there's still going to be people who believe, you know, lies and conspiracies and, you know, what you can say, no, it's not true, but, you know, it doesn't matter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being willing to step up and take this huge challenge on. I really, I, I am just in awe of your bravery and your dedication and I mean the time. I know, I know how busy. I've got, you know, three going through this. There, there, there is no time to breathe. And I wanted to say, Peter, thank you so much. You have led this committee and this community and this district 
through some very difficult times with a tremendous amount of balance and understanding and caring and honesty and really true dedication. And I really, I want you to know, I, I not only appreciate it, I am proud that you are here and thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I'll go next. So first of all, I, I, I want to reiterate what I said last week. It's clear that Colonial's alumni feel great pride in the Colonial's mascot, and they can, should, and will always be Colonial's. But it is time to move forward as a community, and I hope that everyone will join us in supporting the revolution. And as we move forward with this, we will continue to find opportunities to both recognize our past and celebrate our future. And you know, I, in reflecting on what was presented to us tonight, there were a couple, couple words that just kept uh, coming up and I wanted to, to share those with you. What I heard over and over again from everybody, I heard the word community, I heard the word voice, I heard the word honor, I heard process, student-led, pride, and most importantly, I heard revolution. And so I am fully in support of this and I thank everyone who participated in the committee to come up with that. I am so grateful for the time and the care that you've given to this, your love and action for your fellow students, and for you, the alums, the adults who have led this. You have done so much. You have endured so much along with us. So I want to start this by saying thank you for that. So on April 19th, 1775, a multiracial group of Acton Minutemen marched into dawn to answer an urgent call to liberate themselves from their status as colonial subjects of a far off monarch and to embark upon a revolutionary path that ultimately led to the formation of a new, independent, sovereign nation. In the cold, and in the dark, in the face of bullet volley, unto death, they fought for what we take for granted 247 years later, the opportunity to create our own future. We are blessed to see our community change, morph, and grow. Our students have been given the extraordinary gift to feel grounded in our community's history and to use that foundation to reach, to risk, and to realize their destinies. Two years of this conversation, this personal, visceral conversation, confirms that the restless spirit that was present here centuries ago still lingers. And it presents us with a tension that this town has so often needed to confront, a tension between the push for change and evolution on one hand versus the pull of traditions and longtime norms on the other, a tension between two forces that must both be respected. We've received many emails from AB alum who have told us with their full throats that they will forever be colonials. I honor that. And to those of you who have told us that, my reply is, uh, is this, which is, and, and I offer this earnestly, and it is this, I am not asking you to change. By all means, retain that identity for yourselves if you so choose. But we also received many requests to change the mascot, and I honor that too. With my vote today, and I will be voting today, I affirm the current students of AB. I tell them that they too have a voice and a place in the story of Acton and Boxborough. I serve to affirm this student body, this diverse 
student body, this restless, able, impressive student body. And if a future generation of students chooses to change the mascot again, I hope that today's students, tomorrow's alum, will affirm that choice too. I hope that when the emotions calm and as time goes on, our collective restless spirit will take on a bit of the grace I tried to keep in this transition. I accepted Angie Show's friendly amendment to re recognize the bravery of Acton's Minutemen. I applauded and accepted Adam's suggestion of recognizing the positive attributes of our town's history in our students. Let there now be grace to allow our students to take on this new identity of revolution, to make it their own, and to share it with our greater community. Grace to welcome our current student body into the long history of our towns and their school. Grace to hear their voices and make space for their contributions. Grace for them to feel grounded in our support as they reach, as they risk, and as they realize who they are destined to become. Thank you very much, Kara. With that, I'll ask, is there a motion to accept the Acton-Boxborough Revolution as the new mascot of the AB Regional Schools? So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? One abstention. Thank you very much. We are on to our next order of business. As we switch over, I'll again thank the naming subcommittee for their diligent work on this, and I'm very pleased that we can move forward with this process. Oh, yes, so we are gonna take a, like a three minute break since we've got to switch over to an amazing cadre of elementary principals. Cadre, is that not the right word? Dana's giving me a frown. I need, I need an author. What? I don't know, crew. We're gonna switch over to the next pre presenters, please. Six, right? Dana, cadre is a small group of people specially trained for a particular purpose or profession. You frowned at me.
All right, I'm going to try and regain control of the evening so we can move on. If it weren't clear, I lost control a long time ago. But uh, I, I am glad to welcome our elementary school principals for an update. Peter, would you like to give an intro? Sure. Um, I am so pleased. Uh, I'll let the elementary principals introduce themselves, um, but I'm just thrilled with the work this group has been doing together this year. Uh, we gave them a choice um, this year of how they wanted to present, whether they wanted to do kind of individual school presentations or whether they wanted to just come and present as a group. Um, they've been working together all year on a variety of initiatives, and so they decided they wanted to present as a group. It doesn't mean that they don't all have very individual and unique schools um, that have you know, their own cultures, their traditions, um, things like that, that they work on uh, every day um, as a huge part of their work, and they'll share a little bit about that throughout the, the presentation. Um, but they also wanted to be able to come and talk to you as a group about some of the work that they are doing across schools. Um, since we have an opportunity to embarrass one of the members, uh, <laughs> Lynn, one? why do you think I'm going to talk about you? <laughs> um, I do want to just take an opportunity uh, and recognize and thank Lynn Newman, um, who is retiring at the end of this year as the Gates School Principal. and congratulate her, not only on her retirement, but something even far, far, far more important, the upcoming wedding in her family. Oh. So. <laughs> yeah. And Lynn, as I always know, you like to go shopping today. I think you took it a little too far going shopping today. Um, <laughs> and instead of going out and buying her something really nice, she came back with a cast. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> you know, Lynn is also presenting as being injured in the line of duty, walking across a parking lot. Um, so, Lynn, thank you so much for the dedication in all seriousness for everything you've done for the district over the years. Thank you so much. You are a stable voice. You are thoughtful. You, you know, just run this incredible school, and we are all going to miss you very, very much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, it is with very mixed emotions, I'm not going to lie. Um, I've been at Gates for 14 years, and it has changed, it has grown, and it is truly a very special community. And I think what brings me the greatest joy is that um, we've always considered ourselves to be a family, and I know that that's important to all of the families that go to Gates. So, and working here in Acton with Peter, with Marie, with, with all the team, my amazing colleagues, it's been truly an honor to be here. So I'm excited for my next steps, but I always will look back very proudly to have been the Gates principal. So thank you. Well, good evening. I'm going to start. I'm Dana Lab. I'm the principal of Blanchard. And as we introduce slides, we will introduce ourselves. Um, we wanted to start out this evening um, by sharing that we, we felt like this is a first for me in terms of coming together for a school improvement plan um, together as a team. And we felt like we wanted to do this together because we wanted to highlight the work in, in that we've been doing together all year. And so we really appreciate the autonomy that we all get at our individual schools, but we also understand that we need to come together on some goals. And so we've spent a lot of time together talking about the district and, uh, strategic objectives, engaged learning, inclusive practices, and equitable outcomes. And so tonight we wanna share some of the specific strategic initiatives and where we started. And then we want to highlight a few things at each of our building that we've been doing with our hardworking staff. And then we want to close the night with talking about where we're at now and what our aspirations are. So that's where we'll begin. So I wanted to highlight the first strategic initiative, which is 3.1, which talks about MTSS. Prior to this year, schools were in very different places with MTSS, different phases throughout. Um, and we've had opportunities since coming together in August to talk about shared goals in ways that we can expand our conversations, we can visit each other and have observations around tiered instruction. 
principals developed large instructional leadership teams that they're building to talk about data and roles and responsibilities and to include more leadership. Schools structured schedules to include wind blocks and tiered instructional blocks at all levels and provide opportunities for instructional meetings using norms and protocols. We've done peer observations. We've met together in small groups and breakout groups. And um, tonight, we want to share with you unique highlights that reflect some of these district goals. So the strategic objective for inclusive practices ensure that all students, staff, and families feel welcome and included by strengthening school culture and climate and intentionally culturally responsive instructional practices and materials. The inclusive practices have, have emerged as important school improvement goals for all of our elementary schools. And what, as, as Dana has mentioned, what makes them unique are action steps, the steps that we decide to go forward with that will allow us to achieve these goals. So, and with those actions, um, takes a lot of cohesiveness with your staff and to take actions that sometimes are not very popular, but at the same time we know that they're in the best interest of our students. Good evening, I'm Juliana Schneider, the principal of Miriam School. It's an honor to be here this evening together and to present to all of you. I will just speak briefly about the strategic initiative around social and emotional learning. Um, this school year, it's hard to believe, we came back together after nearly a third of our students had actually not stepped foot in the building for almost a year and a half. And so we came into this year anticipating the need of building warm and welcoming communities, recognizing that students would have lagging skills in areas that would have typically developed around their ability to interact with one another, to regulate all sorts of the um, social emotional learning that happens in the classroom. And we knew that the connections that were established between children as well as between adults and children were going to be incredibly important and that taking the time to do that in our schools, in our classrooms, with our kindergartners, our sixth graders, our adult communities was the investment that we all needed to make. And so that was a commitment that we made across all of our buildings. We also each use elements of different curriculum, including responsive classroom, open circle, social thinking, and really came in with a toolbox. Um, teachers who are trauma informed as well. And like many things, there's variability within buildings and across buildings. And so that's been something that we have examined throughout this year and worked together to think about how to meet the needs of our students that we actually anticipated and some that we didn't anticipate. And so a lot of our energy this year has been in um, responding on the ground, but also thinking forward for the future, which Christy will speak to at the end. So a couple of things that we're really proud of at Blanchard, and I'll try to speak quickly. Um, some of it focused around culturally responsive practices and DEI. Um, three highlights that we had this year were uh, Mr. Votto, Mike Votto, who's our AP. Um, he and I worked together with the librarian, the reading specialist, and the literacy coach um, to figure out ways that we could refresh classroom libraries, including more graphic novels and picture and chapter books. We spent $12,000 out of our school budget to give each educator, including special educators um, and specialists, $500 each in order to refresh those classrooms. And we got input from families as well who provided a lot of information. We also um, embarked on teacher DEI drop-in sessions uh, on Wednesdays when we had some free ones available. And I think we're most proud of the DEI family advisory that we put together with over 20 families participating as a great representation of our school population. We have had three sessions. 
Um, and um, that work has helped support our anti-racist action plan. We do problems of practice and really help each other out as a community, and we're working towards active ways that we can include voice, student voice, at our school and decisions that we make. The other big highlight, too, is around our building-based professional learning. Um, we try to provide a robust offering to all the educators. So in K through two, we had Melissa Orkin, which came in and did a lot of work with us in a workshop series around how to plan instructions and use evidence-based routines to help support our science of reading. Um, Gail Walsh, who is retiring this year, is our school counselor. And she uh, took a third of the staff to work on SEL practices and they discussed a lot of strategies together and looked at trends and really worked hard to develop tiered instruction for our MTSS in terms of SEL and behavior and figure out ways that we, she could change her schedule to help support all the tiers in SEL. And then finally, Mr. Vado and I worked on uh, some PLC work with our, um, the other third of our staff um, around how to really support our instructional meetings with our staff at the grade level, but also how we could support each other as a larger instructional team. We used a lot of the work out of the, um, uh, the, leadership, um, the leadership academy, thank you, um, in terms of how we were going to move from a collegial um, building, which we are, to more of an accountable. And so how we could come up with norms and protocols to really support each other and be really efficient and how not only we work together, but really get to the basis of what's best for students and the data that we're looking at in order to inform our instruction. So we were really proud of that. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. I'm Val Granzowitz, the new principal at Conant. Um, what I first want to share with folks that, that some of the work that we've been doing at Conant it are the concrete steps we've taken to grow our culturally responsive practice. Foundational to culturally responsive practice is really explicitly creating space to respect and value all that children bring with them into their classrooms, all aspects of their identities. This could be identifying windows and mirrors, sliding glass doors in curriculum and literature. For us this year, what we did is for each child in each classroom, they created an identity web, a snapshot of how they see themselves right now in this moment. That web will travel with them as they progress through the grades and hoping that um, eventually they'll be able to look back and reflect on the evolution of their identity, sort of how they saw themselves and how those pieces evolved over time. We also had an opportunity to invite Dr. Kim Parker to our school. Uh, for some professional learning. Dr. Parker's expertise lies in the intersection of literacy development and culturally responsive practice. We invited author Karen Parsons of the Sweet Blackberry Foundation to come read to all seven of our grade levels. After those read-alouds, she was able to visit individual classrooms. We had teacher teams develop um, lesson activities that were based on the themes in the book that connected to wherever they were in the curriculum. For example, Bessie Coleman, who's the first African-American and indigenous woman to earn a pilot's license, um, they did a connected activity on force and motion in airplanes. Another highlight that I'd like to share is some of the successes that we are seeing in building out our MTSS and coaching practice at Conan. Our kindergarten team has engaged in some ongoing coaching with our literacy coach supported by our reading specialist. Um, this team has utilized data from our early bird and Dibbles screeners first to expand and grow our tier one instruction in phonemic awareness really targeted. If there's 73% of the class who needs more support with deletion explicitly, we're growing that instruction in that area. And also to develop targeted group instruction for those skills at a tier two level. With the progress monitoring tools from Hegarty, we're seeing great growth after that targeted instruction in tier two. And several students, many students, the majority at this point, no longer require that tier two instruction. So for folks who are really um, engaged in those early literacy 
skills and how critical the PA skills are, this is really wonderful progress to see in the kindergarten level. Um, so really excited to share that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lucia Sullivan. I'm the interim principal at Douglas. And I wanted to talk a little bit about our work creating a multi-tiered system of support at Douglas this year, because that was really one of our primary foci. So we did focus on social emotional learning and diversity, equity, and inclusion. But this feels like it is the, the thing that has come to the most completion at this point in the school year. So we were able to, as, as all my colleagues did, develop a school-based leadership team we visited Blanchard and looked at their model and sent over teams of teachers and other folks to have a look. We created schedules, as did my colleagues, with intervention blocks and really helped the new coaches and specialists find their footing in terms of what their role was in the school and the way that they could be helpful. As we're looking forward to the second half, or you know, as we've begun the second half of the year and looking forward, it's really heartening to see now teachers are having regular data meetings. The teachers, the specialists, the coaches, they're planning together, they're planning interventions. The work that people were asking about in the beginning of the year because they didn't understand is now becoming part of the culture, the practice, the way things are done. Um, I was really heartened to hear that one of the teachers was at town meeting speaking about it, and that was a, a surprise, but wonderful. Um, and the leadership um, team has been planning professional learning to support that work. So we've, um, we've worked on a distributive leadership model so that the teachers are doing uh, like a summer book club. They each got to pick books either focused on diversity and equity, inclusion and justice, or SEL or MTSS, and all the things are really connected. So we're gonna be doing the work in all three areas, but they're able to lean into the particular practices that they're most engaged in, and then they'll be working with their colleagues to plan professional development that is teacher-developed teacher and teacher-grown. Um, and we're really seeing uh, the learning growth is really measurable in terms of the impact, so that's exciting. And then just a couple other quick highlights. Just having everyone back and reestablishing community has really been heartwarming. We were doing um, identity work that was led by our art teacher, Lauren Gould. So similar to what they're doing at Conant, but different, the children were making identity circles. And that sort of culminated on Wednesday with students sharing their identity uh, circles with the whole school at a community meeting. Um, and then finally, just really a focus on effective instruction and joy at school, like helping kids reestablish routines and practices and predictable, expected days and to feel really good about being at school and you know, re-enter sort of more normal life. So we're looking forward to more of that next year. So this year, what I'm going to be highlighting are some of the culturally responsive activities and events that we've had this year. Um, this year, the Gate School faculty, um, our professional learning was guided to designing culturally responsive teaching practices. We partnered with the Conan School, which was really awesome. So we were able to bring the two communities together. And so we have some similar activities. The identity mapping was really um, a real highlight. And to see that done with kindergarten through sixth grade, they were really awesome. You could go into the classroom, look at their maps, and the kids were just so proud to really explain you know, who they were. And so that activity in its own way, they learn about themselves, but then the students learn about their, their, um, their peers. And so that really develops a nice respect and begin to see, these are my friends, these are who they are, and to, um, to gain that understanding. We also um, did some recording, so being able to pronounce somebody's name is extremely important, and so um, we made that another initiative. So we recorded, the students recorded their, their name, and then we were able to put those into, um, into a power school. So when I call a family, if there is, a spelling or a name that I want to make sure, you know, we all, the staff, want to make sure that we're saying someone's name correctly. So, but I do know that at Conant, you guys have a, a, a code, right? A QR, code. a QR code that they've done. So that's something that sounds really exciting. So we'll have to lean in on Conant and see what that looks like. 
Um, so we've also are very committed to developing our classroom libraries and we've discovered that they really needed to be bolstered. So um, we wanted to make sure that our, that our libraries really are relevant and reflect the diversity of our students. So that's something we've been working on. And I would thank Sharon, Ryan, and Doris Sanchez for their help. They have did some R&D work this summer. We were able to import some of those books into our collection. Um, this spring, uh, we, had, we have book buddies, like most of the schools do, and our kindergarten, second, and fifth grade classes came together, and they had a multicultural book buddy book tasting. And so what they did is they were tasting books from different cultures. Um, our fifth graders were reading to our younger students, and we were able to invite AB seniors to come that day because it was the Senior Community Service Day. So a big cafeteria full of all these um, students, past and present, celebrating the books. The students voted on the books they want, and we're going to be buying those books for our new library at the, in the new school. And finally, um, after a two-year hiatus because <clears throat> because of COVID, um, the PTO was able to host our cultural showcase. And I was really wondering, would people come? You know, it was our first event. And I, I think I said to the custodian, I don't think we're gonna need all the tables. Well, by golly, we needed all the tables. We were just full, 200 families, you know, all in there together, so it was great. And so when you have that event, um, it started small, but it's one of those activities that's grown. So we ended up having um, a variety of, of performances. We have the youngest to the oldest in fashion. A fashion show walks across the stage. And when you see a little kindergartner walking across, let me tell you, it's just too cute. Um, we had tables and booths so that everybody would be able to participate. And um, it was really wonderful. The, the students um, leading up to the event had created um, international art pieces, and we were able to merge them into one um, piece of artwork, which will be going to the new school. So, um, and the, in addition to those, of course, our flags that are in the cafeteria will also be coming with us to the new school. And I can't help but, but thank my staff for enduring two years of building construction. Holy mackerel. mackerel. Um, we're ready, we're excited, and We've been able to, in our all-school meetings, include that building project with us. So it's been a tremendous um, effort. And the kids, everybody's really been um, committed. And with the eye on the prize that we're going to be moving into a beautiful new school. So thank you. Good evening. I'm Christy Neal, and I'm the principal at McCarthy Town. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. I'm very proud to talk about some of the successes um, this year at McT. The most important goal we had was reconnecting our community, and I'd like to start by just thanking our PTSO for their partnership with Carrie Lewis, our parent coordinator. They have done a tremendous job with PTSO celebrations, really bringing back our entire community into joyful events. Um, and in addition to that, we've done some work with our staff and our students to make sure that during school, we've reconnected the community as well. The first piece we did with staff was to create vertical teams. When I entered in September, the staff really talked about that during COVID, they had become siloed into their own individual grade levels. So building vertical teams that met regularly with different grade level teachers, special educators, related service providers, created teams that got to know each other and share their own stories and share their experiences, really built and connected the culture of staff. We also did work with Dr. Liza Talusan, who helped us gain tools and capacity to have courageous conversations. Um, in order to connect our families, we also worked with our PTSO to develop a DEI subcommittee. That group is gonna have many purposes moving forward. Um, one important one is to look at all of our celebrations and our community events and our school-wide events to make sure they're matching some of our school-wide values and district-wide values. Um, to connect our students, we brought back assemblies. They were virtual this year. We kept really hoping each month they would be in person and then being like, eh, not yet. Um, but the virtual assemblies are just a space where each grade level can share what they're learning 
Um, we also brought back learning buddies, which are a chance, again, to create some of that vertical alignment and vertical community, but this time with our students. Um, as always at McCarthy Town, we use art integration as the basis for our community and our learning. Um, and this year, we really tried to articulate the social emotional learning that happens within art integration, the problem solving, the persistence, the getting to know themselves as learners. The next really important goal at McT was exploring our data culture as the foundation for MTSS. Um, so knowing that we want to move into a more robust MTSS system, this year we really focused on how do the adults work together when we're looking at assessment. So we built data norms and data protocols that help us unpack what are we looking at at the big themes of the data, and what are we looking at with the small individual data for each student. Um, and our kindergarten and first grade teams piloted mixed groupings and interventions. That's something that will grow for next year in our MTSS system. The last thing I just want to say is a huge thank you to my staff and our PTSO and our families and our students. It's been a challenging year and the third year of the um, sort of triad of challenging years and they've done tremendous work on all of these things and I am so, so grateful to be part of that community. So I will take this opportunity to highlight a couple of things that we are proud of that we have accomplished this year at Miriam School. And I'm actually going to start with the second one that is on the slide, which is relooping the school. You may know that Miriam is a looping school and we have always had kindergarten as a standalone grade. And then first graders looped to second, third to fourth and fifth to sixth, staying with the same classroom cohort and teacher over two years. Because our school was so disrupted during the pandemic, every loop was broken. And so when we brought everybody back together, it made sense to take the opportunity to change the loops so that K would loop to first grade, second to third, fourth to fifth, and sixth would be stand alone, which really follows the development of children early. It supports early literacy in kindergarten and first grade and allows for sixth graders to build independence and even um, as content gets more heavy, have some departmentalization. So we started the first year of that this year. It also allowed for an opportunity to really examine the curriculum resources we were using to teach content area. So our teachers worked with Dora Sanchez and Sharon Ryan, our curriculum coordinators, to look at the books they were using to support um, curriculum and were able to get rid of quite a few books and we allocated a tremendous amount of money from our budget to purchase books. An example would be in fourth grade, we bought a lot of books to support indigenous people and the content um, and integrated that into a project. So we reorganized our book room spaces and with looping, there's a lot of organizational pieces so that work really came together and it will continue next year as teachers teach the second half of the loop. We also, in an effort to support MTSS and the data culture and all of the work that we're doing across schools, um, continue to build out our projects um, with our project-based learning model with the STEAM lens and really focused on access for every child. A couple of examples that I would like to share um, this year is we had fully integrated STEAM weeks for both fourth and fifth grade. So over a five-day period, children um, were fully included in their classroom. Every child was fully included to go through a learning process in fifth grade to build lunar modules and in fourth grade to build kinetic sculptures. And so there's a lot involved in that, but it, it was it's an amazing learning opportunity. It's fully based on standards and it's just really engaging for the children. In addition to that, we had our first solstice stroll. It was hard to find ways to bring the community together this year with so many COVID restrictions. And our STEAM coach had been doing monthly STEAM challenges, K to six with children in our 
December challenge happened to be building lanterns and a beautiful organic opportunity to display those lanterns right before we left for vacation. We served hot chocolate and it was just a really welcomed event for family, embodied steam and community and really a wonderful um, community event that I'm highlighting among others. So thank you. So as we look forward to next year, we are excited to continue working together on continuing to support and build multi-tiered systems of support to support social emotional learning and culturally responsive practices. In regards to MTSS, um, we're continuing to support the coaches and specialists as they support the teachers to build capacity to use data driven decision making in their instruction. And as a district, we're working on a shared playbook that will support ongoing collaboration so that all leaders in the district can benefit from a collected um, sort of album of resources. Another goal that we will continue to work on for next year across all six elementary schools is the continued focus on SEL. We're excited to have the use of the panorama data to help us make groupings and make data-driven decisions about curriculum and resources um, that will drive all of the work across all six buildings. Andrew is also gonna talk more about the SEL plan in his presentation, so I don't wanna steal his thunder. <laughs> Uh, and just to share some plans around our progress toward um, growing our capacity as culturally responsive educators. And next year, um, I know you've heard this, but each school will have a team of culturally responsive teacher leaders uh, that will um, collaborate to really target the needs at each building and where the entry points are and what our work needs to be at each building. Um, we'll continue to collaborate with the curriculum department to identify natural opportunities um, to reimagine our curriculum, Juliana's example of the fourth grade uh, unit, the regions unit, and thinking about that from an indigenous people's lens um, is a great example of that. Um, we're also growing our body of seed leaders. We currently have eight seed leaders district wide, and we're growing that to 17. We have nine folks joining the Seed New Leaders Week uh, this summer. So those are some examples of our CRP future. And this ends our presentation, our collective presentation. We'd like to thank all members of the school committee for your support, attention, and um, we're available for any questions you might have. Can I add one thing that I didn't say? <laughs> I just wanted to say as we look toward next year, we expect to continue to close achievement gaps in our continued collaboration and ensure that every student in AP reaches or exceeds grade level expectations. So before um, I ask Adam if I could just jump in, I intentionally didn't do this at the beginning because I wanted to really highlight Lynn and thank her for her time. But I also want to take an opportunity, thank you Juliana for all that you've given. Um, as you know, Juliana has accepted a position much, much closer to home. Um, we're gonna miss you tremendously. I appreciate um, all that you've given to the team. I appreciate your thought. Um, I really appreciate you know, how you've had to navigate that tension. Um, between thinking about how to preserve the uniqueness of Miriam um, and the special place that it is with also having to really think about how can we coordinate to, you know, for the benefit of all of our students district-wide. So thank you so much for all you've done. Thank you, Peter, and thank you to all of you. My eight years here in Acton Boxborough, I feel like I could never have imagined the learning experiences that I have had the opportunity to engage with through my work with students, my work with families, um, teachers, and the community. And I am forever grateful and feel prepared for anything and look forward to having an eight minute commute after, li I live in Ipswich, so it's, it's bittersweet. I will miss Miriam tremendously. It's a very special school and I, Hope that people advocate to keep what it is that is unique about um, the culture in all of our schools because passionate teachers 
allow children to learn in the best environments, and we have a lot of passionate teachers. So thank you all. Thank you. All right. I want to keep an eye on the time. It's 845, and we've not even gotten to our ongoing business. So I'll ask those who ask questions to make them brief, and I'll also ask those who answer questions to make them brief. Amy, and then Evelyn. I just wanted to say I love this. I love the presentation tonight. I love the fact that you are all able to highlight your individualities as, your, as schools, and yet to, the, the way that you are leaning on each other and you um, have, have shared your strengths um, and reached out to each other to just really make each of the schools even better than they are. So thank you very much. So I wanted to echo um, some of what Amy said and say thank you for all the hard work you're doing. I was listening to each one of you present and I was hearing things like inclusive practices, D and I, and I, Val read my mind, I was gonna ask about how you're bridging the achievement gaps in each school, but you know, as an African, they always say to us that there's no education you can get if you're not a better person. So the foundational blocks that you're helping these kids build now, they're going to take it up into middle school, into high school, into colleges, they'll be better people. We have very intelligent people that are worse people in this world. We don't want them. You'd rather be, <laughs> you know, be so smart and be a good person. You add value to life. So thank you so much for taking care of everybody and building these inclusive environments so every kid in this district can thrive. Um, I just want to congratulate you because I've been on the school committee for, this is the end of my fifth year, and this is the first time I have ever, ever, ever heard an elementary presentation where you actually sounded like you were all part of the same district. So I totally and completely appreciate the uniqueness of every school, but this presentation highlighted that you can be unique and different and have your own way and still be reaching for the same goals in the same ways. And so I think that, bravo. I'm gonna backpack on Tessa because I've, I've been here for a while too. And while I'm, I'm so happy to see a, a consistency across, what I was really happy to hear were words like data and success. Um, and I know in particular in this year to have such success when we wanted so hard for things to be back to normal and they weren't. And so I wanna congratulate you and thank you for making the amazing progress that you did this year in what continues to be an extremely challenging environment. So thank you for that. Any more questions from the committee, comments? Devin. Thank you all for the hard work. I guess uh, I cannot imagine as an outsider of the education community, I can imagine how much work is you guys has to done, has to do uh, to make this happen. So I have a t two kind of a small questions. Why is I can, uh, so if I remember correctly for the MTSS, uh, we have a uh, nine coach to support, uh, whatever, I thought uh, it's uh, each grade has a two coach to support all school, six schools, each grade. So is there's three literacy coaches that work across, they each work across two schools, yep. and there's three math coaches, and they, or STEAM coaches, and they each work across two yep. schools. And then there's a math specialist and a reading specialist in each school as a full-time employee. Yeah, so, yeah, then I, I got the impression like each coach needed to take care of uh, two schools. All right, so does that, do, you, do they feel too stretched? That's well, one. we understand the financial constraints that exist in the, the motivation of MTSS is to address a disproportion uh, issue. So when I'm excited, I mean, ego to see the outcome, how do we, uh, when do I, do we expect that? Well, we can do data presentations for you next year, but I don't know. I'm we can send you information. I don't know. They're not all be like, why are you okay. saying that? <laughs> So, yeah, but I think, you know, one of the things that we're very aware of is, you know, we're coming from a district that had never collected um, ongoing benchmark assessment data that was consistent across all of our schools. Uh, we solely relied on MCAS uh, to be able to 
you know, compare what we were doing with progress, and that, that can be really challenging because MCAS, the analysis happens so far after when you can give an assessment. Um, the, you know, the first year we used Panorama was to try that on, understand the assessment tool, get some initial data, but it was also during a pandemic year where kids were in hybrid, you know, instruction or remote, and so it wasn't really a great indicator of what to expect. So this year was the first year of real consistent data collection that happened three times over the course of the year. And I don't want to say that the only data we use is Panorama. We actually have a whole variety of data. But in terms of benchmarking, Panorama is kind of designed to be that benchmark assessment. So I think once, now that we've gone through a year of understanding the data and collecting a, a fairly stable benchmark, we'll be able to actually start to shift a little bit. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of data and information that goes into how students make progress, um, and I don't want to also exclude the information that our teachers give us based on their observations in class. That's incredibly valuable. But I think in terms of what you're looking for, the hard data, I think you'll expect to see that over the next year or so. Excellent. Thank you very much for joining us this evening, staying late. We appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. All right, up next on our agenda is a very special project <laughs> presented to us by our very special director of special projects. Oh. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little sad that Andrew didn't wear a vest tonight to match me because yeah, I purposefully wore one to match him. Oops. Good evening, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well, including you, Adam. <laughs> Let's see, we go to view. Oh, the presentation on? Oh, yeah, slideshow. There we go. It's good to see everybody. Um, I think this is the first presentation since transitioning. Um, so it's nice to see all of you. I think I've worked with you in different capacities. It's, it's nice to transition into a role where I get to work with all the schools in a different capacity, but I will also say I still, uh, and I hope you'll forgive me, have a soft spot for the, the junior high school. So I'm so glad that you saw the presentation that Jim Marcotte gave at the last school committee meeting, although I would still like to note that he went over his allotted time. <laughs> Just, you know, he's got some growing to do. Um, and then he kindly uh, made a phone call last week because their, their administrators were out last Friday, so they asked if I would actually uh, reprise my role as principal on, on Friday the 13th. So what could go wrong? And within half an hour of getting there, half the bathrooms had a sewage backup. So um, I think he plotted that, I, I'm pretty sure. But it's, uh, it's good to be in this role. Uh, I'm actually here on behalf of myself and Deb Bookis. We um, were, I, I'm supporting Deb in the MTSS work this year uh, at the district level. And so I'm providing all of you a very quick summary of the work around MTSS, which you've all heard about. Um, not really gonna get into the details of what the, what the outcomes were, but really to provide you just with some overview of how we pursued the process. Because I think as you've heard from the principal presentations, this is a core element of our work, both at the individual schools and at the district level. Um, and as several of you mentioned, whether it was Adam or Tessa or even you, Kira, or previously, the tension between the importance of valuing sort of tradition and things that uh, are important to preserve because they are good for an organization or a community, as well as finding ways to move forward on areas that you identify that you want to be doing better or different things in. How do you? How do you marry the two and how do you address the tension between the two? And that's an important area. So I think what we clearly felt like we needed to do was create uh, a committee at the district level that tried to wrestle with those issues because I think aspirationally it's easy to say those things, to actually put those in practice where people can feel comfortable and excited about sort of the decisions and, and the trade-offs that are made um, is a whole different thing. So we created a steering committee uh, towards the, the late fall um, that comprised various administrators, school-based administrators, and educators from across the schools, 14 of them, uh, and really were viewed as the stewards and shepherds of this work to try and wrestle with that tension of what are, you know, as we think about the philosophy and the goals of MTSS, what are we trying to implement? 
what are the areas where consistency really is important for us in terms of meeting those goals and where are the areas where we want to preserve um, the ability for individual schools to identify the ways that they can meet those goals in the ways that are unique to them. And we eventually um, identified for rolling out NTSS, there are four categories or sort of four areas that we needed to work on. Um, how do we understand data, developing a robust and good data culture? What are the roles and responsibilities that people have in this process? How do we make sure that people sort of understand kind of their place, their entry points, not only with each other as colleagues, but with students if and when they need certain services and supports? What are those supports? How do we define what would be a tier one, tier two, tier three, and the importance of consistency in that regard? And then, of course, the, the all-important operation, the nuts and bolts of things. Schedule, 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 time, resources. How do you marry all of those um, issues at individual schools in ways that you can actually implement them with the resources that you have? So we broke up into four groups, and then we invited another um, sort of cohort of educators from all the schools to represent the schools. In total, we had about 40, 45 individuals from across the elementary schools in the district um, to divide themselves into those working groups and try and wrestle with those issues had several meetings throughout uh, the winter and spring in terms of sort of establishing what are our priorities, why are we doing what we're doing, the way we're going to do it, um, sort of keeping our eye on the prize, if you will, in terms of what is the objective that we have for MTSS, what is the, what is the driver for us, and as many of you already mentioned, you know, around um, ensuring success for all students, addressing more specifically and more thoughtfully um, achievement gap areas, uh, disproportionality, and then also identifying what are the implementation challenges that we'll have next year. And so we had working group meetings that worked through those pieces, both in terms of the logistics, but also just in terms of philosophy. Um, there are lots of different moments where we would spend time just sort of saying, why are we doing what we're doing? You know, why, why are we reimagining um, these areas? And we sort of had to regroup and then re, sort of reassess and then kind of come back to the importance of, of of the work that we're doing around supporting all students. As I think Lucia mentioned, ultimately kind of the deliverable that we wanted to come up with uh, at the end of this year, and we're very close, which I'm very pleased to say, is, is a playbook, an album, if you will, of, of guidance to all schools, to all educators around. Here are the areas, we call them loose and tight. Here are the areas where we think that consistency is critical. This is where, as we commit to this model of MTSS, these are the non-negotiables at which each school sort of has to commit themselves to in terms of the services that are provided, the frequency in which certain services are provided, and then also um, the way that we approach um, data and the benchmarks that Peter talked about. So not only is what is a multi-tiered system of support, but what is the roadmap to actually implementation uh, at different schools. And un understanding that different schools are at different places and so those pathways will be different but the destination um, really has certain features that would be the same. The, the um, as I said, you know, those groups talked about kind of the logistics. I think what we wanted to make sure that we did as a playbook that was not just aspirational but actually was functional. That somebody at a school, an, a, a, an IST team or an ILT team could look at that um, playbook and actually get guidance and reminders about the steps that they needed to take uh, to implement MTSS next year and to, and to work through it. What I want to show you here, not necessarily to get too much into it, but maybe to start socializing this image because my speculation is that over the next year, Peter or others might start using this image a little bit more frequently to try and help articulate um, MTSS and services around um, not only the different tiers of support and the different levels of support, but in the different arenas in which we would view tiers of support. And I think for this particular um, presentation, I think what we're trying to sh um, remind ourselves is MTSS is not just about academic support, it's also around the social, emotion, and behavior support. So we know that it's not just about sort of identifying what students need uh, around their growth in areas that iReady might measure but also in the other areas that we talk about in terms of their social emotional learning and behavioral supports because those are all necessary in terms of students who, the students, having the student, all students flourish. Um, and so I'm just showing, these aren't things that I'm gonna get too much into, but these are just graphics that I wanna identify as kind of what you'll see in, in sort of future presentations is when we describe kind of universal supports, what are the supports that we would provide to all students in, in a classroom setting 
what are the supports that a smaller cohort of students would be identified as requiring, whether it's from a mass specialist or from the general educator themselves, and then the intensive supports for the students who, again, are identified as requiring um, a more significant level of intervention. The playbook, you know, as I said again, the playbook we really want to emphasize as being practical and useful. So along with kind of direction, our work this summer, and I actually just sent an email to um, the working group to see who might be interested, is actually developing some materials that will be useful um, so people don't have to build the plane and fly it at the same time next year. Templates for letters that we would send to families to provide them a guidance around um, the services that are being suggested for students. What about frequently asked questions? What about uh, links to um, public and staff sites to provide a little bit more guidance? And so that's kind of our work this, this summer. And then next year, we will continue to have a district-wide MTSS team to again analyze the work that we're doing and the progress that we're making, uh, analyze district data, and compiling sort of uh, school-based self-assessments on around where they're going, whether things need to be changed. The schedule continues to be something that I know people are working hard on and, and will take a lot of work and to live the schedule for a year and see where adjustments need to be made and we of course have to provide professional learning for our teachers that's ongoing that um, can help them feel successful and, and empowered in this, in this work. Um, I do want to mention some of the work that's being done that speaks to some of the pieces that you said, you know, Evelyn beforehand separately you'd, you'd mentioned in sort of the urgency around, you know, making sure that we embed and we institutionalize those questions that you're asking. What about the students for whom have not experienced consistently success in our district? What about the disproportionality of students who are black and brown in our community? One of the things that we've committed to is in our protocols, and actually we just wrote it the other day, when data teams are meeting and they're going through the data, there's actually explicit questions that ask them, what are the subgroups, what, are, what is the disaggregated data in which you might identify areas that are of concern in the, in, through that lens. That's great, and, and I think that's step one. Step two is obviously then developing practice and confidence in asking those questions and then being okay with uncomfortable answers. You know, so I think we can build worksheets all we want, but then how we actually engage with them and, and, and the ability to feel vulnerable in some of those answers, I think, is the next kind of adaptive piece. But, we are building those into it. And then of course the next piece is providing data uh, comfortably to, to the teachers who are doing this work. Right now, because we don't have a fixed system, we all live in sort of this, this swamp of Google spreadsheets that just kind of, kind of uh, reproduce on their own. Um, and it's just confusing and, and, and overwhelming. And so Peter just mentioned Panorama. I think you actually meant iReady when you were talking about the benchmarks, but Panorama, which is up here, is a platform, it's a data platform that we have now um, sort of uh, bought into, for lack of a better term, and we're excited in, and we're onboarding the information where teachers and teams will have all of that information uh, in one setting. And so the iReady data, MCAS data, um, qualitative data that they can upload, attendance data, the SEL survey that we have, those are all in one place, and so instead of trying to search through different folders, we're hoping that we can streamline it so that there's more accessibility and therefore hopefully a little bit more comfort with engaging um, more dynamically with it. So that's uh, the quick summary, much shorter than Mr. Marcotte. And Andrew, could you just go back to the tiers and the percent Please. of students to expect? You know, I think one of the things is you see this that you may have a question on is, you know, how does this intersect with special education um, and students with disabilities? I think, you know, one, it's really important to recognize that MTSS is not a substitute for students who need specialized services. And it's really important to recognize that we have a population of students who need specialized services through an IEP or need accommodations through Section 504. Um, this is not intended to replace that. This is a general education environment that's available to all, all students, students, regardless of disability status. And so even students um, who might have services related to an IEP also have access to the, the supports and structures available through MTSS as well. So, you know, it's not either or, and it's not one deters the other. They're actually designed to work in concert with each other as a more effective way of supporting all students um, who have complex needs. Thanks, Peter. No, not at all. Thanks, Thank Andrew. You. All right, questions or comments from the committee? Andrew, if you can turn your mic off. Thank you, sir. Questions or comments from the committee? 
go for it. I'm just glad that you qualified what Panorama is because I'm sitting here thinking, I thought we did iReady. When did that change? What is he talking about? I haven't missed that many meetings. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to thank you. Um, I, I, I do have a, a quick question. Let me see if I can go back and see where it came from. I think you, you touched on it a bit. And, and you know, it's really, as a committee, we, we talked about the data early on. We had concerns about the disproportionality. We, we agreed that MTSS was the route to go. And then we got a lot of feedback from, from teachers in the classroom that this was going to be hard. And I guess I'm curious to hear in your working groups and then maybe from some of the elementary principals, as we've started to put the data in place, as we've started to roll out some of that practice, are minds changing? Is there, you know, what are the concerns and what are the, what are the sort of moments of aha that, that the, the teachers have had? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I can probably offer it from a very general view. I don't know if any of the principals here, I don't want to call on any of them, although I will say that McCarthy Town, I did attend some of their meetings where, what, what did you call it this year? Play, play with the idea of falling in love. With falling in love with data and sort of really um, kind of entering the shallow end of the pool and developing some comfort. So I don't know if you, if you want to, if you, I feel like I've been listening. I can't move the chair. <laughs> so as I spoke about a little bit, McCarthy Town took this first step towards MTSS by growing our own data norms and really looking at how do we as adults approach data and what's scary about that and what's exciting about that and what's awesome about that. And really looking at that there's an opportunity when you look at data that helps you find the next steps and prioritize and make sure we're not missing blind spots. Um, and so our hope in that framing that first year was that teachers would have a sense of psychological safety as we looked at data together. Um, the second part of your question is, are minds shifting? And I think they are, but I think as we wrote the playbook, we talked about a multi-year process and making sure that we're leaving space for staff to enter the shallow end of the pool and walk together into like, a safe place where we can have courageous conversations and we can enjoy the data so that we continue to have it be sustainable. Thank you. Adam, the other thing that I would mention is I think that I feel like I can contribute to is in the conversations with the working groups and then I was part of the data protocol subgroup is there's also an ongoing recognition, importantly so that, um, to sort of borrow that phrase, that you know, not all things that count can easily be counted. And so acknowledging that there is a place uh, and an importance to identify um, sort of feedback that may not necessarily show up as easily in a, in a numerical metric, but how do we create space and honor that in a way that contributes to sort of our, our portrait of a student. Thanks. Any other questions or comments from the committee before I go to the public? Madam Public? <laughs> There we go. Yes, still here. Um, so thank you, Peter, for making that point for me. But that wasn't actually why I was going to stand up. But thank you. Um, the only thing I would add, and I know that folks here know, is that MTSS is not a reason to delay or deny eligibility valuation for special education. We know. Um, I'm really glad, Andrew, that the family communication templates are being developed. And I'm going to channel Bill Guthlein for just a second. And you and I remember who that is. How will data be shared consistently with families? Um, it used to be that families wouldn't necessarily know if a child was working with a reading specialist. They might stumble across their kid in a hallway while volunteering. Um, we don't have homework, and I'm glad we don't have to fight that battle personally, um, but it's hard to know if a kid misses a skill. You know, that report cards, some buildings have three, some buildings have none, and the reporting can be opaque and can mask missing skills. The stack of paper comes home at the end of the term, but it's out of context. So while you shore up your pre-referral and guidance for the ISTs, I strongly encourage data sharing and consistent notification practices, because if we don't know when our kids are receiving tier three or tier two, we can't help them, and we can't partner with you in supporting them. Thanks, Amanda. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Public? Go ahead. I'm just gonna echo everything that Amanda said, because she's a genius, thank you, Amanda. Um, and I would like to expand that and say I, I would love to see 
I would love for you to come back, because I'd like you to be here, with some data, right? With some answers for Evelyn's questions. Um, and to turn this graphic, it's a lot of graphic, into um, something just maybe a touch more readable that we can then share with the public and start normalizing this and, and normalizing the data, um, not just visually, um, but, but conceptually, so we, that we can see, we can know what's actually having, happening in the district. So, um, I, you know, I love this, and I'm glad that we're doing this toward the end of the year, but I, you know, I hope that next year when we do an agenda, that we see you more than once, maybe three times. You know, hit us once with this again, hit us the second time with this is where we're going, and then at the end of the year, this is what we've done, if that makes sense. Thank you, sir. Great. Thank you, Andrew. All right, next item on our agenda. <laughs> they're clapping because they're done. That's right. They're clapping because they get to go home now. Yeah. Uh, Kirsten Nelson, <laughs> our food services director, is up next to talk about the food services program. So while Kirsten's getting set up, I just want to say, you know, I don't know if you know Kirsten, but she is one of the rock stars of the district who does not ever get the public attention that she deserves uh, or any of her staff deserve. Um, this has been an incredibly challenging few years for food services. Uh, Kirsten, you have been absolutely amazing, not only in what you've done for students, um, but what you've done for the community as well. So um, as you recall and we've shared, you know, our food services program served almost 300,000 meals to the community during the pandemic, in addition to feeding our students, right, and making sure they did that. So I just can't give you enough credit for all that you've done, and I'm glad that we're able to hear from you a little bit and talk about kind of where things are at in food services, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And I also want to thank our staff, because they have certainly worked hard for the last few years. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kirsten, and thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, we thought we'd give a brief summary of what we've done over the last year. Uh, we started off the year with a few audits that we had. Uh, we had a few scheduled from the Department of Ed. We had an administrative review. We had a procurement review. And then we also had a district financial audit with Powers and Sullivan. All three of the reviews reported positive results, um, all good um, feedback. And so that was just a little bit of extra work that we had on top of the regular norm this year, but it all went well. Um, some of our accomplishments, we're currently serving um, a substantial number of meals over pre-pandemic numbers. Um, in 18 and 19, we were serving on average 200 meals, uh, 200 breakfasts a day. Uh, we're now at about 1,000 per day, so we're definitely seeing a huge increase in numbers for um, breakfast. Our lunch participation has gone up as well. In 18 and 19, we served um, about 2,500 meals per day, and we're at about 3,300 meals per day now. We do consider ourselves to be the busiest restaurant in town. I always say that. Um, and with the federal waivers, obviously, this allows universal free breakfast and lunch, so that's why we're seeing the increase in, in uh, meals for students. Um, additionally, we provide meals for the Victor School and the Case Collaborative in Acton, for those of you that might not know. Um, and we've been able to bring back some fun things this year. We brought back the cooking club at RJ Gray, which is um, something that I'm passionate about and, and know that the students enjoy. Um, we noted about the reviews. Uh, we've been the recipient of some grants. We had a supply chain assistance grant. We also um, applied for a grant for a refrigerated van because uh, we're moving food around a lot more than we normally do. And um, we're also very thankful for the towns of Acton and Boxborough for the CARES Act money that enabled us to serve the adults in our community during COVID. Um, we have implemented half-day lunch uh, meals for all of our students, where we didn't used to do half-day lunches, so now we are. Um, we also have an online ordering system that's available to the community. Uh, let's see what else. Um, as Peter mentioned, we served over 300,000 meals to our community during the curbside meal program, so that's something that we're very proud of. Um, so basically, in summary, uh, the AB Food Service Program has survived the pandemic. <laughs> 
so financially, um, back in fiscal year 18, our ending fund balance was around 680,000. Uh, we had a dip with the pandemic, obviously, and then we've been able to come through this year pretty strong, um, stronger than most, and we are looking at a fund balance of um, 838,000, which includes a reimbursement that we're just waiting to hit the books on, but that's where we're looking for the end of March. Um, so it's a, it's a substantial fund balance at this point for us. Um, and below you'll see a nice breakdown of the federal reimbursement versus the um, paid meals and catering sales, um, blue being the federal and state reimbursements. So you'll see in 18, 19, and 20, our reimbursements were lower and our cash payments were much higher. Um, and then once we um, were allowed to have the waivers and have the free meals, then in fiscal year 21 and 22, most of our revenue is from the federal and state grants um, that we've received for reimbursement. So some of the challenges that we're still facing, um, obviously the sup supply chain has been a huge issue for us. Uh, the availability of goods continues to be a problem. Um, we spend most of our time trying to find food or trying to find paper to serve the food on. Um, we have had a lot of driver shortages, which means we have backlog deliveries. Uh, when we first started school, we had a good week out before we would receive the food that we thought we were gonna receive. So if we had an order that was supposed to be in on a Tuesday, it might not show up until a week, you know, seven, nine days later. So that was pretty challenging for us. Um, we were able to bring in a freezer at the high school, um, an additional outside freezer. So we were able to store and stock up a little bit so that we could be able to serve the students with the food that we could get. Um, let's see, we also had a shortage of staff because we were doing more meals. Uh, we looked at projecting based off of what we were doing last year when all the kids returned and we knew that we had some still remotely, um, but even at that we still um, managed to, to serve more meals. Um, so now we're in a pretty good place with staffing uh, as far as that goes. And then I think, you know, we just have the uncertainty as to whether or not we'll have the waiver for next year. Uh, the federal government has decided not to approve the waiver universally um, for all, um, but it's at the state level now, so we're optimistic that hopefully that will pass. Um, but we do have a requirement federally to adjust our paid lunch meal pricing, which I'll speak to on the next slide. Um, and then the other thing that we're potentially facing is um, seeing the increased level of food insecurity in the community. So for us, lunch prices, um, we are required to meet a certain price point due to our program being federally funded. And currently, as I said, the meals are set to expire, free meals are set to expire on June 30th unless the state picks up the reimbursement. Um, so we're not sure if that's going to be extended or not, and we might not know until June. Um, so we will get the word out as soon as we know. Um, but we would like to propose meal pricing for the 22-23 school year. Um, currently, we are proposing breakfast that there's no change in rate. It would be $1.75. Uh, we're looking to increase the lunch rate by 75 cents to $3.50 for students and adult meals would be, um, breakfast would be 275 plus tax, which is a 25 cent increase and lunch would be 475 plus tax, um, which we currently charge between 350 and five, there's tiered pricing for adults, but, um, and that again is just to be in line with where we need to be with the federal requirements. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to serve our students uh, breakfast and lunch every day. Our motto is a well-fed child is ready to learn. Um, and we'd like to just thank all of you on behalf of Baby Food Services. So if anybody has any questions, I think I'm happy to answer. And otherwise, we need to have a vote on lunch prices. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. If you could turn your mic off, sure. it's a little ringy. Yeah. And then I saw a number of questions. We'll start with Rebecca. This is my inaugural uh, statement or question here. Um, prior to being sworn in, I did meet with a representative from Project Bread, and she was hoping that um, individual school committees around the state could uh, voice their support for the bill that's currently in the, um, I don't know if it's in the state house at the moment. Um, and then second point is um, prior to moving here, uh, when I was like nine or 10, um, I actually grew up in Vermont. And one thing that we had a really strong connection with was local farms. 
um, supplying the schools, and I was wondering if that's something that we'd, we've looked into or we could look into. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so we do purchase from Costa Fruit and Produce, which we do get some of their produce is local. Um, we also work with um, Harvard, in Harvard, Carlson Orchards. So we get fresh apples from them on a regular basis, weekly basis. Um, and we also are working on some more farm to school initiatives. We had, we had a grow rack um, that we did with our second grade level students as well as our high school students where we grew lettuce and basil and allowed them to be part of that program. And then we then fed them at lunch with the lettuce that they grew. So that was pretty exciting and we're going to be bringing that back for the fall. Yeah, thanks uh, for the great work. I, I remember last year, I guess, we served uh, half a million or one million, right? So, so this year is only 300,000? 300, the 300,000 was for curbside meals. Okay. Yeah, but so anyway, thanks for the great work. Uh, uh, so uh, one, one procedure thing, I, I remember when I was a school, I mean, subcommittee, policy of subcommittee, we, we, I also saw you, right? There, yeah. so at that time we reviewed the whatever something also re re related to the meal. I just wonder why this time we come to the committee directly. There's no uh, no preview or no read under the subcommittee. I can, uh, because the increase in the lunch price is a federal requirement. We actually just have to do it. We, we don't get a vote in it. Like, we, we vote it, but we don't get a vote. <laughs> okay. Marie? Well, just, I think the question is what she came to policy about was actually the policy about lunch, and this is the price of lunch, which is a school committee vote, not a change to policy. So school committee votes fees, and, and lunch is a fee, so that's why she'll come back any time we have to change the lunch price directly to the school committee. So uh, how do you come up with that number, like 75% or whatever? So uh, do, you, do you have a data? Um, so I have a, my sense about the inflation, right? right? So, but, but I would like to know that uh, number. Sure. Um, so, whoops, is that me? Okay, um, so we have minimums that we have to meet because of the federal requirements. So the, the government doesn't want to have us, ha if we have students that are paying for lunches, they don't want us to have the students paying less than what the actual reimbursement would be for a free student, because otherwise they're, they're somewhat filling the gap, right? So we have to meet the minimums, and that's why we're setting the price. It's based off of what their minimum requirement is. Microphone. So the price actually doesn't mean uh, the increase doesn't may not necessarily cover enough to cover the uh, the expenses. Um, I think. Oops, sorry. I think we're financially in a place that will be okay. Um, we've looked at numbers, and I I also think that the. The amount that we're requesting is a pretty substantial increase. We were going to increase it a couple years ago because and then COVID hit, um, and we weren't able to do that. So we've looked at numbers, and I think we'll be fine with what we're doing. Um, we also, regardless of whether we go to free lunches for next year, we still just have to approve this because if somebody's buying a second lunch or whatever, we still have to have the right rate in there. Other questions or comments? Evelyn. So uh, my question is around the online um, ordering system for the community. You highlighted that, you know, this, am I echoing? Oh, you, you mentioned um, food insecurity in the community. So that this was my first time of hearing that there was anything like there's some, you could order lunch online or something for community members. How do we publicize that so people who need it can get it? 
so we're currently only allowed to serve meals to students. Um, it, it was during the pandemic when we were not in school, we were allowed to serve, well, we were only allowed to really serve to students, but the town of Acton and Boxborough gave us money um, for, the CARES, for the CARES Act to be able to fund adult meals. Ben. And I think, actually, Evelyn, I'm sorry, I think the, um, what you might be referring to about the online ordering is we offer things like Red's Best Seafood by the pound that people can buy, and we offer that at pretty much a wholesale cost. It's just something that we offer that is probably once a month or so that we put out there to the community. So that might be what you're also thinking of. I just thought of that after, sorry. Quick question, should the uh, federal waiver expire and the state not decide to uh, pick up the tab, what will be the impact for students and how will you ensure that no student will fall through the cracks? Because again, we've seen a substantial increase over 2018 to 2019 compared to today uh, from 2,500 students per day to 3,300. What will be done to ensure those students who can't afford those lunches do not fall through the cracks? That's a great question. Um, we have what we call a virtual gateway where we upload all of our students into a database every month. Um, and that spits back to us if anybody's on SNAP or parts of Mass Health. Um, so there's an automatic match there. So what we've seen when I first started 16 years ago, um, our numbers were at 2% for free and reduced and now we're at about 11 and a half. So we've definitely seen an increase, but it's, it's because I do believe of the um, virtual gateway and the fact that people don't always have to come and fill out an application to be found, right? Um, so that's been nice for us to be able to have that. It's somewhat seamless. Um, and we also do have um, online applications if somebody weren't on SNAP or, um, or parts of Mass Health, uh, so they can go online and it, it comes right into our office and we would approve it that way. Um, and if somebody is really struggling, we also have ways to help. Great, thank you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I'll just read from policy EDF, which is the one that Yevin mentioned. One of the paragraphs in there says, the school district will provide a meal to students who forget or lose their lunch money or who have a negative balance on their account. No student will be denied a meal. So we've already codified that in policy for sure. Kirsten, I want to express my gratitude to you and your team. I think I shared with you um, earlier in this year, my son uh, at Blanchard gets a breakfast almost every morning. and. Uh, He's not a fan of change, and one morning, because of supply chain shortages, there were no bagels and cream cheese, and the staff at Blanchard were absolutely amazing. They emailed his teacher, his teacher emailed us, and we prepared him for that, and he went into school so happy knowing that there was going to be something for breakfast, but it was going to be a change, and it was just an amazing uh, bit of teamwork from your staff through the entire staff in the, in the building. So again, thank you for the amazing work that you and your staff do. If you're not already following AB Food Services on social media, please do so. There's been some great staff highlights there. So uh, again, thank you for the amazing work. Thank you for pl the plug on social media. We're trying to highlight our staff on Mondays, so please do feel free to stay tuned because we're finding some interesting fun facts about our staff to share. Can I just add one thing? First of all, thank you, Kirsten, um, and your team. We, one thing we haven't talked about this year is at the beginning of COVID, we started a food security task force with um, representatives from Acton and Boxborough, and that still continues. So Kirsten and I both participate in that. We meet tomorrow. Um, we went from weekly to biweekly to now monthly, um, but it's the Acton Food Pantry, Community Supper, Open Table in Maynard, um, us, and a few others, sometimes the Senior Center folks. And there has been so much partnership and exchange of ideas and materials and grants and storage and refrigeration and, you know, supplying diapers. I'm sure tomorrow we're going to be talking about baby formula, like whatever's come along. Um, the United Way is a part of it as well. So I just, I want to thank Kirsten for her work and um, this teamwork and um, things like the supply chain issues, things like when the Boston, Greater, Greater Boston Food Bank wasn't able to come as often. Like there are these things that come along that impact families' ability to provide food. And um, so it's really been uh, powerful and positive experience. 
I just want to remind everybody here that the the um, budget, the state budget, has not been finalized yet. There is still opportunity for us to get waivers, get money, get this help. Um, so, I, you know, if, if the federal government waiver lapses, which would be extraordinarily disappointing, um, there's still opportunity in the state, and we have legislature, le legislators who live in our towns, and we see them at the coffee shop. So say hi, and remind them that the babies are hungry. Um, and thank you so much. You are amazing, and your team is amazing. Thank you. So. Is there a motion to set the FY23 Act and Boxborough Regional School District lunch prices as presented? So moved. Seconded. All right, so we'll give that move to Andrew this time and the second to Kira. Hey, I'm the chair, I get to choose, and you guys didn't turn your mics on. All right, so all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Thank you so much. Thanks for staying so long. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to our ongoing business, uh, superintendent's annual evaluation. So, um, as we presented last week, uh, our schedule for the evaluation as Peter gets set up, um, we're going to see his presentation today of a, an update on where they are in the goals. And then, I'm scrolling and scrolling. Anybody remember what day it was that you needed to get your evaluation information to me? July 1st. <laughs> I think Kira just volunteered to help me write the evaluation. Oh, that is not true. <laughs> June 2nd, please. Uh, we will have um, the review this evening, uh, and then we've got June 2nd is when I need to have you all uh, submit your um, evaluations of the superintendent. I will also make the call out now that members of the public may also send their uh, input to both myself and Beth Petter. Our email addresses are in the agenda. So if any members of the public wish to provide some uh, input on the evaluation of the superintendent, please email myself and Beth Petter. Same for the evaluations of the superintendent for the school committee. Uh, Beth will be sending those out uh, to you in an uh, editable format. Please fill them out online or digitally and then submit them to uh, again, me and Beth. With that, Peter, I will hand it over to you to present. Okay, so I'm gonna do a presentation that is designed to be sensitive to the length of the agenda tonight. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on a presentation. Um, I wanna highlight that included in your packet is a cover memo and a bit of a reflection that I did on the year. I'd like to point you to that. I'm gonna talk through a little bit of that tonight. Um, I also provided you a second update on the district goals. I took the same template that I gave you mid-year and added two additional columns for an end-of-year status and then some comments um, so that you could actually see how that flowed throughout the year. And it also was in the similar format to what you saw at the beginning of the year. Um, there's also in the packet a PDF of the evaluation template that you'll be using so you could get a sense of that. Um, and as Adam said, uh, there are two documents actually that will be emailed to you directly. One is an editable version of the evaluation template. Um, and then the second is a copy of the Massachusetts superintendent rubric um, for evaluation. I just want to point out, I pulled a couple of things off of the rubric because I wanted to highlight a couple of things for you. First, up top, the image that you see is actually a screen grab of the actual evaluation template. And this is the section on goals that you can see. And so you'll see that I identified as a stu the student learning goal. Um, what I did is I went through the rubric and I pulled off um, sample indicators that you could look at as you were thinking about the student learning goal. Um, and so the description of the goal is exactly as you saw in that district improvement plan that you voted at the beginning of the year. Um, and you actually heard our elementary principals talking about that and Andrew talking about it, uh, which was 3.1, develop and implement and align district-wide pre-K through 12 multi-tiered system of support, right? So that was the district goal. That was our student learning goal. Um, and one of the indicators that I aligned it to was 1-C-2. And so now, if you look below, 
when you get the superintendent rubric, this is what you might see for 1-C-2. You would see a rating for unsatisfactory, you would see a rating for needs improvement, a description of what proficient performance looks like and what exemplary performance looks like. Um, and so that as you're thinking about those goals and what we did, it also gives you a sense of my overall performance um, for the year so that you can correlate the two. But I wanted to really clearly draw the, this concept of a focus indicator back to the superintendent rubric and show you how those two are related in an example. Um, some tips for you, you know, evaluation should consider but are not limited to goals. All right, other aspects of a superintendent's performance should certainly be included in your comments and your ratings. Um, evidence that you might want to consider, presentations and updates that we give throughout the year, uh, personal observations of my work, feedback that you receive about me, and updates that I provide or the, the administrative team provides about various goals. So all of that is fair in a superintendent's evaluation, but ultimately, for whatever evidence that you're looking at, it's also about your judgment about that evidence. And so really, it's this is a judgment piece, and all evaluation is judgment, right? And so I would ask you to take a look at all of that, look at the evidence that you have, but ultimately, this is your role to be able to you know, put that judgment label to it um, as guided by the rubric. So the rubric is not gospel. The rubric is there to guide you in your thinking. Um, some other things you might consider. Obviously, progress toward the goals. And I pointed you to the, the document that's in your packet, uh, which is our end of the year goals update. But what I also wanted to do was highlight some of the other work that was my responsibility or our team's responsibility over the course of the year, um, just to pique your thinking about ways that you can expand beyond goals. So, you know, we welcomed multiple new school and district leaders, um, and we're beginning to build a high performing team. Um, we are continuing to manage the COVID pandemic, including the impacts of Delta and the various Omicron va variants and the impact on our schools. We had to address some urgent and complex needs of our students as we emerge uh, from two interrupted years of schooling. We were managing the dissolution of the EDCO Collaborative, structuring a process by which our students uh, could lead a mascot renaming process, engaging with families through monthly superintendent coffees and various written updates, managing a challenging budget process and working to increase end of year turnbacks to mitigate the impact of declining in reserves on future budgets, monitoring completion of the boardwalk campus building and returning to full education programming and a resumption of activities for our students this year. So that's not a full list, but I wanted to give you some examples just so you could think beyond just the district goals and get a broader picture of what, what a superintendent and team might do. I want to also just highlight a few things that I thought went well this year and a few areas that I would identify for my own personal growth. Um, hopefully this makes it a little bit easier for you as a starting point. Um, I actually think that our principal and staff efforts that they had on a daily basis to meet the needs of our students were absolutely exemplary. I'm so proud of the work that all of our educators did. Um, you know, they persevered through some staffing shortages and supported students with both urgent and complex needs at a level that we simply have not seen before in schools, or at least in our schools. Um, I'm also proud of the work of our MTSS steering committee that brought together educators and leaders from across our elementary schools to develop a common vision for a multi-tiered system of support. Um, the vision provides a foundation for a district-wide approach to the work and also allows for the individual personalities and cultures of each school to personalize implementation of the system. I'm proud of the courage and perseverance of our students involved in the mascot renaming process and grateful to our subcommittee for their ongoing support of the students. Students led a process that provided for significant community input into the selection of a new mascot. And while we recognize that the final selection could not please everyone, um, they continued to engage the community and selected a mascot and that, in their words, acknowledges our past but speaks to our future. I'm also pleased that through the coaching relationship with the Leader Leadership Academy, we have started to gain a deeper understanding about the needs of our students from historically underserved populations. The Leadership Academy has helped us by conducting focus groups, meet, focus groups 
meetings with student groups, helped facilitate connections between student groups and school administration, has provided ongoing support uh, to our school and district leaders in managing problems of practice and aligning policies and practices in our schools with a portrait of a culturally responsive school district. Um, and this information and connections through the Leadership Academy will help us to deepen relationships with our students in the coming years. Some opportunities for growth. I think we can better engage our community around complex issues related to our schools. Learning from community feedback about the process used to the, retire the mascot. For example, we put in place a plan to ensure our community had multiple opportunities to provide feedback to us through the mascot renaming process. We also heard feedback from some people in our community that they wanted more input into proposed changes to the high school curricula. Um, our schools will continue to face several complex issues over the next few years, including the development of school budgets within constrained resources and our goals around equity and inclusion. Both of these are going to require us uh, to have ongoing dialogue that engages stakeholders throughout uh, the processes and we need to think deeply about appropriate forms of engagement for our staff, students, families, and the broader community around the complex issues. We need to make a shift from thinking that we can engage people toward the end of a process into making sure that we engage people at the beginning, middle, and end in multiple different ways that they can access based on the needs of the stakeholder group. Um, we also need to find ways to increase educator voice in our decision making, particularly in areas that directly impact students and teachers. The last two years have seen unprecedented disruption to education and our schools have undergone tremendous changes. You just heard from some of our elementary principals and our secondary principals a meeting ago. Um, you know, because of this, I think many educators that I've heard from um, are feeling a loss of control over their work. Um, some of the disruptions are simply beyond our control. We did not create COVID and we certainly don't control COVID as we can all attest to. Um, but. You know, in, and I think in addition, though, we've also shifted some of our educational models, health and res safety restrictions have been shifting throughout the pandemic. Um, you know, there are other changes that have been specific to our district with a focus on universal design for learning, MTSS, implementation of new literacy and math curricula and high school schedule changes. We need to fi help find ways uh, to have our educators have increased voice in these processes. Um, and some of the decision making as we look to the future. I also think we need to think deeply and strategically about our students' social, emotional, um, behavioral health and mental health needs. Uh, pandemic has taken a significant toll on many of our students and this has led to a sharp increase in the number of students demonstrating complex and acute needs in this area. I don't know if you've seen the recent Surgeon General's report that came out, but it's now estimated that just about 45% of adolescents could be diagnosed with a mental health disorder. That is a stunning number, and that is across, you know, um, you know, the entire nation. It, it's really a significant issue, and we've begun planning for that, and I'm looking forward to coming back, but that certainly needs to be a focus of our work going forward. Um, now that, um, I think we need to be prepared to address our students' needs both in the short term and thinking about a longer term strategic plan around social emotional learning, mental health, and behavioral health needs. We also need to think about how we can grow our goals in order to uh, focus on student outcomes where appropriate. So um, our district goals, as you know, have traditionally focused on the inputs and outputs, i.e. professional development or program implementation across the district. Now that we've begun to develop a robust set of data sources to better understand the needs of our students in a systemic way, we can actually leverage that opportunity to focus on student outcomes. Um, it's important to recognize that not all educational outcomes for students can and should be measured in quantifiable ways, so we need to maintain a balanced approach as become more outcome focused. And then finally, and this is the adaptive work that we actually all need to do together. Um, as we move forward into the next goal setting cycle, we need to carefully consider, in other words, we need to limit. Uh, the number of goals to which we commit and evaluate the appropriate number of action steps that can reasonably be accomplished within a year. Um, as stated earlier in the memo that I provided you, um, you know, as the superintendent, I work directly with you and our leadership team to create these goals, but it's actually all of our building leaders and the staff who have to then work to execute everything. And if we continue to create um, 
you know, too many goals with way too many actions, we are going to, you know, really frustrate a lot of our educators across the district because they're being sent in too many different directions. These things take a lot of time. There's adaptive work that's included in this in addition to just some of the technical changes we want to see. Um, and so we really have to be cognizant of the number of goals that we're creating um, so that we don't overwhelm all of the educators in our district. So. Um, you know, I hope by highlighting a few of the areas that I think I can continue to grow um, on my own and work with our leadership team and also in work with you, that helps provide, you know, some seeds for how you might approach, you know, an evaluation this year. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Peter. Questions from the committee? Evelyn. So I really like that last goal, Peter. And you know, I've always been concerned about the number of goals we have and whether it, if it's feasible to achieve those. So I like the fact that we need to think strategically about the goals that will move this district forward. We don't need to have a whole laundry list of it, but come up with the goals that will really move us forward, but that are achievable and that will not burn out our staff. So I really like that. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. And I will just bring us all back to, I think, October of this year. If you remember our initial goals discussion, I think the first one I came to you and I had six goals and then I tried to come back and I said I needed to take one off and we voted six goals. <laughs> um, we weren't successful in reducing the number. You are not gonna see me propose six goals again, nor five goals. Um, we're really, you know, we're gonna limit these. Um, what I think you'll see from me moving forward, we will certainly have a student learning goal of something in our students learning that we want to improve. Um, I've been thinking a lot about that. I believe it will probably target the area of disproportionality um, and disproportionate outcomes among student populations is where I'd like to set my student learning goal. I'm not sure of it yet, but that's my thinking. Um, the professional practice goal you see will be specific to my own growth, not for all of our educators to have to work on, but what am I doing? Um, and then I will probably propose three district-wide goals um, just to kind of frame how you might anticipate something coming forward for, for next year's goals. But we'll, we'll talk more about that at an upcoming meeting. I'll just share that for those of you that are new to this, it's like completely and totally overwhelming. I'm absolutely positive. Um, but having sat on the school committee now for five years, I have to say like, I know you felt overwhelmed by six goals, but when we have presentations like we did from the principals today, I mean, you know, I don't have to write anything to you, Adam, A plus. Like, I never thought when you and I sat for two years and talked about all the things of like rowing in the same direction and like trying to not all be islands and, you know, there there is some perspective that comes from doing this for more than a year. And so I think that we all do have to take the perspective of some of these goals are longer term than just what you could accomplish in a year and that you've been, obviously all the steps are laid out and it's, you know, in the, in the document and all those specific things, but as someone who's now sat here and seen many of the things that you walked into our district and noticed in your, you know, entry plan and everything else, like you've accomplished a lot. <laughs> there's like a lot of stuff that obviously there's plenty that still needs to happen, and I understand that, you know, these these goals are longer term, but. It, it's important to also look back and say, where were we like a couple years ago and where are we now? And you know, I don't think I thought that we'd be having successful conversations about MTSS because it didn't seem at the time like there was literally any way to get there. So you know, uh, just as everyone approaches this, if you haven't been on the committee for a long time, and some of you, Rebecca, will not have to do this until next year, but um, you can just sit back and say, woohoo, I'm so glad I don't have to do this. But um, you know, there, there is some perspective to be taken because these aren't just, you know, standalone year-to-year -year goals. They are longer term than that, and they, and they take a lot more work. No, thank you. I think my hope is that, you know, even starting with next year's goals, we make a little bit of shift. So rather than a goal being something like we're going to implement MTSS, what I would like to do, and I've started talking with our leadership team about, is shifting that to we're increasing the number of students who are meeting or exceeding their stretch goal in literacy and math in a given year. Um, and so it's actually, you know, MTSS, we had to work on the framework first, but the the purpose of it is actually to help improve outcomes for students. And that's where I really want to see us shifting. So 
uh, we're not there yet. Um, and you know, we've started to make some of the headway that I want us to make, but I'm always also cognizant there's a huge gap between what the school committee gets to see, the superintendent gets to see, what our principals get to see, and what the daily lives of our educators look like and the daily lives of our students look like. We can never forget that as we're implementing this stuff, there's actual work that has to take place with our educators and our students to actually make a difference for kids. And it takes an incredible amount of time and energy to teach on a daily basis, but then to shift practice while teaching is also another thing. So th Tess, I absolutely appreciate that. I just wanna make sure we keep that eye on the prize of it's actually about the work between teachers and students and ultimately about the outcomes we have for students. All right, any last questions for Peter? Any last questions about this process before we move on? Yevon. Probably some confusing questions. I just wanted to um, wonder, uh, so we have a elementary, junior high, high school, probably different school, different levels. They have a, a different goals. Uh, so, so, Peter, you are setting up the goals, I guess, across the district, try to um, generate the impact over the, over the all district. So I wonder, is any goal, I mean, is, has to be a district-wide impact or can be related to the, so MTSS, I see, it's actually, it's a, it's a long-term emphasis on the strength, and, I mean, the, the elementary school. But what about the others? Uh, so, like high school, well, is there any goal, say, linked to that? that? That's a great question. Um, at the last meeting, not tonight, but two weeks ago, um, Joni Dean, the high school principal, and Jim Marcotte, the junior high principal, actually presented their goals, and you actually saw how their goals related to the framework that we had as a district. Um, so, you know, that certainly is something that we've thought about, and yeah, we do, it, they look different in every school. Um, in fact, even if elementary schools share an MTSS school, the work that has to happen on a daily basis is slightly different in each school. And then similarly, as we work on culturally responsive practice or social emotional learning, it will look different for the high school than it looks for the junior high, different for the junior high than the elementary schools. So. There, there's an overarching target that we're all working toward because we're all serving the same students over years, but the action steps that schools take toward that have to recognize where each school and each group of students are at. Yes. Oh, I understand, it's com very complicated. I just wonder, so, so for example, the engagement, uh, uh, social, emotional learning, probably uh, to supporting in that perspective, in that area, maybe, in the elementary may require a lot of time and that's, uh, that's important. But when, when kids grow up towards uh, high school, probably is that still the top priority or could be something else? Could be, I mean, just. Yeah, then I would, I would suggest reviewing the video that, that uh, Joni and Jim presented because they actually talked about how they were putting SEL learning into place through advisory programs at the high school. And I think that combined with what we've heard around the significant um, mental health uh, challenges at the, at the secondary level, there's definitely a, you know, there's, there's room for improvement in that goal for those students at that level. All right. Are you raising your hand to say something or can we move on? Excellent. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we're going to move on to the next item on the agenda. Uh, there's a memo in your packet that I wrote. Uh, as you know, we're all governed by policies here. We have a policy BDEA, sorry, BDA, um, which defines how we reorganize our committee. Uh, the policy says that the committee reorganizes the first uh, evening or the first meeting that we have all of the members sworn in. We do not have our member from Boxborough, our new member from Boxborough sworn in yet, so the policy states that it would be at the next meeting at which all the members are sworn in. The next meeting on the 9th of June, I will happen, I happen to be out of town and Kira will be chairing the meeting at that time. And so I'm requesting that uh, the committee consider postponing that meeting. Now, to postpone the meeting means to postpone the policy and to postpone the policy, there's a policy for postponing policies 
which is policy BGF, the suspension of policies. All of this is in the memo and linked to all of our policies. So uh, there is a motion in the packet, uh, and I wonder if anybody is willing to make that motion. Andrew. I recommend we move to suspend policy BDA procedure BDA-R's requirement that the ABRSC reorganization occur at the first regularly scheduled committee meeting after all new members have been sworn in and to postpone the reorganization until June 16th, 2022, when Adam is back in town with gifts. Is there second. a second? <laughs> Evelyn, second. Evelyn has seconded. With gifts. With, With gifts. gifts. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, so uh, just as a note, <laughs> this is a two thirds. Uh, we need two thirds of the members in attendance required to pass this. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Any With opposed? Gifts. Any abstentions? That passes unanimously with gifts. <laughs> with gifts. With gifts. With gifts. All right. Yeah. Yep. I Magnets. Like my, my kids, my wife, stickers. and my school committee will all receive airport <laughs> gifts stickers, yes. from Brazil or Chile. Ah, <laughs> uh, Peter, do you have a gift for us about the EDCO update? I do have a gift. So the EDCO board met today. Um, I am pleased to report that we are on schedule uh, to be able to close. Um, you know, as of June 30th, it's a sad day from an EDCO standpoint, um, but I think from a mitigation of risk standpoint, it was certainly something we needed to do. Um, you know, all districts, as I think I mentioned previously, have agreed to meet their financial obligations. Um, most districts have already paid and the funds have been received. We have paid for the lease in full and the lease settlement through EDCO, so that's one less liability. Um, Right now, the executive director is finalizing a letter to DESE, um, you know, basically, you know, affirming that all of the actions that DESE required for EDCO to be able to close have now been met. Um, I'm pl very pleased to report to you that, you know, now that we've paid the lease settlement costs, there will be, there's enough funds available in EDCO to not require any districts to pay additional closing costs. If you remember, we thought we might have to pay almost a half a million dollars in lease settlement costs, uh, plus closing costs. We ended up paying just about $100,000 in lease settlement costs, so you know that came right down. Uh, we will have zero in closing costs, and there's actually going to be enough money uh, in the EDCO funds at, once we close to then be able to reimburse districts after July 1st. Uh, we anticipate it'll be in two parts. Um, based on the available funds, I'm, you know, I, I certainly don't want you to hold me this. I'm going to guess we're going to get back somewhere between fifty and seventy-five thousand dollars to AB, um, because there's, you know, probably, you know, we have a couple of, uh, you know, um, grants that we need to work through and make sure, you know, we've refunded any money that we received through the grants. But um, right now we have about one point five-ish million um, in assets in the EDCO checking and gift accounts. So. Um, those will be distributed to districts, you know, as the auditors feel comfortable closing out and refunding money. So that's some good news. So, you know, all said and done, the net expense for closure was probably about $25,000 to $50,000, somewhere in that range. And that's new to Dave, too, when he looked very excited. <laughs> Thank you for gifts. Yes. Exactly. Thanks. Any questions or comments for Peter on EDCO? One subcommittee update this evening from the Community Engagement Subcommittee. Andrew. Thank you. The ABR SDSC CESC, also known as the Act in Box for our Regional School District School Committee Community Engagement Subcommittee, met on May 6, 2022. Our discussion topics included the town meeting support, where the ABR SDSC CESC will review the town meeting to better understand how to be develop opportunities to clarify communication between the community and the committee. In 2022 and 2023 engagement planning, the ABR SDSC CESC will focus on creating consistent connections within the community and existing community groups to facilitate the discussion within the community of school focused topics and issues. Our schools are the center of our community. Our efforts in this group can provide venues and vehicles for conversation and connection. The next meeting will be the Friday after our next school committee meeting, wherein we will compare our airport travel gifts. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, on to our consent agenda. 
Items on the consent agenda do not usually require discussion and are approved with one vote unless any member would like to hold an item for discussion and a separate vote. I'll read each item name and if any member would like it held, please say hold. It is. So before I read these down, Peter's going to make a comment about one of the items, which is our bus lease. So we are presenting a bus lease to you. We lease buses annually. It's cost effective. The school committee has actually seen this lease multiple times. They go out to bid. You know, we accept the low bid, um, and there's a process involved in that. Um, you know, JD and I talked. I did not want him to have to wait here until 9, 30, 10 o'clock at night just to talk about this because it's pretty standard. Um, so I am happy to answer any questions. He's excited to come back to you because he is working toward an electric bus initiative. Um, that we want to see in the future. Right now, he's actually in the stage of trying to do some procurement um, to possibly be able to lease enough land or purchase enough land to then put um, charging stations for electric buses because that's going to be an important element of, of being able to convert to electric. So, you know, there's more to come on that next year. The, it's just not ready yet for us at this point, but it's certainly the direction we're headed. But we still need these bus leases. Um, this is the low bid. So we're presenting it to you for your approval as part of the consent agenda. Thanks, Peter. All right, item number one, approval of the ABRSC meeting minutes of May 5th, 2022. Item two, the recommendation to approve the bus lease agreement and addendum between Net Leasing Corp and ABRSD dated July 1st, 2022. And the recommendation to approve a donation of $1,800 from Miriam PTO. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Second. Okay, uh, Tessa and Kira would be the second on that. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Thank you all very much. On to our statement of warrants and recommendation to approve. Uh, as someone pulls this up to read them off, I just want to make a uh, call out here to thank those members of the warrant sub signing subcommittee for their fast response to the uh, warrant signing that needed to happen. John historically was the number one replier on that, and uh, we've we filled his shoes nicely there. So if everyone has reviewed the warrants, uh, the motion language is found at the end of the memo. Would someone like to make that motion? I move that the school committee vote to approve number P2223 dated 5-5-2022 in the amount of $2,724,388.57. Payroll deduction warrants as follows. Number 22023PR dated 5-5-2022 in the amount of $548,855.52. Vendor warrants as follows. Number 22023A, dated 5-5-2022, in the amount of $407.16. And number 22023, dated 5-12-2022, in the amount of $1,898,196.36. Seconded. Ben got that with his microphone. <laughs> so, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimous. Thank you. Peter, is there anything in the FYI that you would like to highlight? We have covered just about everything I can think of tonight. <laughs> so. And then some, yeah. with gifts. So, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. I put my mic on. Beth? You did. Uh, we'll go with Tessa and Ben. Actually, <laughs> and Amy. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you all. Good night. <laughs>